uh, at any time. Jeff, do you have anything you want to add to that? I'm going to take a drink of caffeine. No, man, I think you did a, a, a fantastic, the fantastic job that just the main key points that we want people to get is just a, a total, you know, GDW and, and all of our subsidiaries, we because of, of how we're structured, you know, it's a total front to end, front to back um, operation. And I think that's what people, um, you know, what you guys definitely need to understand, Um you know, because of our different divisions, different uh, subsidiaries, you know, we really can do everything really well, uh, regardless. And, you know, if you want to source direct in China, we've got people in China, um, you know, and then we've got, you know, the group over here and everything that we're doing over here. And we're we're doing what we're doing for you. So every day we're selling our own products and we're packaging and prepping and labeling and FNS canoeing and, you know, inserting and creating brands and logos and everything for our own products. So we're always on the up and up of everything that's going on in all the distribution channels, all the sales channels, all the marketing channels now um, as well. And I just don't know anybody else that's doing that. So um, we'd love for you to make a home here in some way shape or form because you really would never you'd never need to leave yep that's it well and you definitely you know hopefully you guys are going to get value out of the uh, information that we're going to provide here now because we're going to go into something that a lot of people don't talk about and that's the real cost of private label and it really is this is a no holds barred look at new product and business launch costs and we're going to go into depth in a lot of different areas from sourcing to shipping to uh, prepping and packaging, uh, to all those different costs, and I've got some examples in here. This is uh, this is uh, something that we went with our mastermind group, and I presented it to them a couple of weeks ago, and had them look at it. And really, the the information that came back was uh, was substantially positive because it is a look at what it really takes to make this happen, not fluff, but the reality of it. So. The reason I did this is because there's a lot of noise out there on the web about striking gold with e-commerce. You know, come, let me show you how to sell on Amazon. You can, you know, make thousands of dollars a month or, or Shopify, come and Shopify or come to eBay or, or, or many of the others. And the gurus come out and they tell us how easy this is. Just show us some products from China, go to Alibaba, sell it online. There's all these buyers waiting to buy your goods. Well, that's only partly true. It's only part of the story. So the goal for us, or when I put this together, excuse me, the goal when I put this together was to outline the most common costs of creating a private label brand to sell online. And hopefully I, I do a good job of communicating the, the large volume, the plethora of costs, the challenges that are needed to complete products and provide you some examples to help you out and show you some actual costs that you know, do not mimic the advertising costs of many of the internet marketing people that are out there. So hop on for the ride, guys. We're going to see, uh, hopefully, a difference in how you build your business. So we're going to go over these 10 topics tonight. First, we're going to talk about sourcing our products. We're going to talk about, you know, some of the best ways that I've found to source products, primarily in the private label arena. Now, when I started, like many of you, it it wasn't in private label. I was sourcing products using general arbitrage rules and wholesale. But uh, we have we have basically converted our business to 100% private label and eliminated the hassles that we got from doing online arbitrage, retail arbitrage, general arbitrage, or, or wholesale type models in sales. Those, those all come with their own unique challenges and I find that the margins and the amount of challenges just, although uh, it, it was profitable, it just wasn't uh, as profitable as it could be if you built your own brand. We're going to talk about packaging. Packaging and, and what's important today as far as packaging and how you can save money in packaging and start launching products and keeping our costs down when we launch those products by taking uh, time and effort in how we package initially. We're going to talk about shipping. There's a lot of people out there promoting, you know, door-to-door -door shipping or, or what's called express, 
or air freight or things like that. And we're going to talk about the differences between them. I'm going to show you some actual examples of shipping prices and compare the different shipping options that you may have. We're going to talk about preparing your products to go into Amazon. Uh, if you are going into Amazon or you're using any third-party logistic provider, including GDW for fulfillment, and you're fulfilling into you know maybe your Etsy store or your eBay store, and you're having someone else fulfill that way, there's costs involved in that, and a lot of people don't talk about those costs, and they are there, and you need to make sure that you understand them so that when you look at your business and you look at how you're going to price things, that you're pricing it appropriately. We're going to talk about duty a lot, and duty or taxes as many ones. We we will will we're going to not go a lot into the value added tax, and then primarily that's because I don't have to deal with it that much right now. And so, but we'll kind of we'll kind of talk a little bit about duty and and what that involves, and ensuring that we kind of talk about how that how you calculate it, where you can look up those kind of things. We're going to talk about marketing today, unlike the early days of the internet. Uh, when I first started, you didn't have to do that much marketing. The big sales channels were doing the marketing for you and giving you that traffic for basically free. You know, for very little money, you were getting tons of traffic. Today, those big sales channels have learned that they can sell that traffic to you, so you're going to end up having marketing costs uh, that you wouldn't have had six or seven years ago. Uh, we're going to talk about the cost of selling products that actually cost you money to sell. Um, any of you who do sell online now will know that you know you have a charge by any of the sales channels uh, in in actually selling the products. But even more than that, there's a cost to sales, uh, no matter how you're selling it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about restocking products. That's just something that a lot of people fall down on. So they get some products moving, they get them selling, and then they don't restock correctly. And so all the effort they put in up front to get a good product moving is lost. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about warehousing and, and uh, the cost of warehousing. And we're going to go over some real-world examples. So let's move into our friend, my friend, and one of my favorite subjects, which is sourcing products. And that's generally, like I said earlier, the first challenge for most of us. I like to go over things kind of in the order in which I see them the necessity to to execute them in order to put together the entire supply chain and and launch a, a complete product, right? So this is kind of the first challenge. We need to source, and there's a bunch of ways you can source. You know, you can go to Alibaba.com. I know a lot of people promote that. Go find some products on Amazon in the top 100 category of sellers on Amazon and then go to Alibaba and find the exact same product through the manufacturer, tweak it a little bit, put your logo on it, and sell that on Amazon. Um, nothing wrong with that, but I do find that that's a slower, more painful method to do things. Uh, it doesn't really take into account the law of averages uh, as well or the 80-20 rule. Um, you end up, at least in my experience, it's four or five, six months before you actually get a product in your hands and are able to start selling it, which means you know, you're starting to take a year to make money. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about my experience there so you can understand where I'm coming from in that. But to me, that's one way you can do it. You can go to different shows. There's a, a large one in Las Vegas, Nevada in the United States called ASD. And uh, I apologize, I don't remember what it stands for, but uh, there's uh, there's quite a few shows like it. There's the big show in New York for the toy for the toy show. Uh, you go to Dallas. There's the the, the trademark. There's the info mart. There is the apparel mart. Uh, there there are a lot of different shows that happen there every single year where you can go and visit all these wholesalers that are basically importing their products from China, putting their brand on it and then wholesaling it to people who want to resell it on a retail channel, like an Amazon or something like that. There are different manufacturer shows, so manufacturers themselves will have a show where they'll invite people who resell their product to come to their specific show that talks about their products, where you can buy those products uh, at a discounted rate and sell them. And then you can do what we talked about earlier, retail arbitrage, RA, GA, general arbitrage, or OA, online arbitrage. 
uh, where you're buying and finding products at a discount online or you're buying it through retail stores. You see a lot of people doing the Walmart, Target, uh, Walgreens shuffle where they go to these different stores all the time and they purchase discounted products to sell online. And there's just so many other ways. Liquidation uh, is another way. That's kind of how I started in this, in this whole venture here and how my store got started. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to source products, right? But for the sake of conversation, let's kind of focus on Alibaba versus direct China sourcing. What I've found through experience and is, is that once I started going to China direct, I found that the products that I was buying on Alibaba cost me 40, 30 to 40% more when I bought them on Alibaba than they did when I bought them direct. And part of that's because those manufacturers have to pay Alibaba money to sell on Alibaba. And they need to make up that money somehow. And the way they make it up is by increasing the price. We've sourced the same products that we were already selling that we had gotten off of Alibaba while we were in China. And we reduced the price per unit with the exact same product from the exact same manufacturers and the same quality for 40% less. So right off the bat a 40% savings, if you're selling anything online right now and you can add 40% to your bottom line today, I think this pays for itself almost instantaneously. We're going to talk about things uh, in a little bit that will kind of help you in that area too because, you know, there's an old saying and I, I may have put it in here, I don't know, I use it a lot and it's called you win on the buy, not on the sell. You win on the buy, not on the sell. Every time, it, you know, people in the stock market make this mistake all the time. They run and they grab some Apple stock when it's at the height of its popularity and it's seven hundred and fifty dollars a share or whatever it is. And then, you know, a couple of years, a couple of years later, it drops down and they're losing money. And then they sell. They sell to get out of it because they're afraid it's going to continue to go down and they lose money. This is the same thing for used cars. It's the same thing in the stock market. It's the same thing when you source products to sell online. You win on the buy. So you got to think about how you can reduce your price per unit to the to the best price you can get today, so that you can be competitive against real sellers online. Direct China with our with our on Alibaba we had higher minimum order quantities. That's what MOQ stands for. And we found that if we went on to direct to China, the MOQs were substantially less. Something that we may have had to buy a thousand or three thousand units as an MOQ on on Alibaba, we could buy a case of fifty four and that would be our MOQ going direct. Uh, it's it's really great and using the quick launch process method that we put together, like I said, you can you can buy as little as one carton uh, in uh, in the places that we source. Unless of course you're at Canton, which is the big giant fair, costs them a lot of money to put that fair on. They tend to be higher price there. You tend to have larger MOQs at that fair. We do not do Canton fair because we found that it doesn't work for our business model. Uh, and it isn't and it isn't very good for people who are just starting out on Amazon who have a limited budget to be able to go to Canton and buy the latest greatest whatchamacallit and have to buy 50,000 of them a full container in order to get into the market that just doesn't work for most people most people that are getting into this business have a budget of five grand or ten grand or fifteen grand and you don't want to you don't want to launch that or put all of that into one product and then put yourself in a position where you don't have money for all of those other subjects that we've talked about and that we'll go into more detail on so if we have smaller MOQs and a better price it allows us to source what we need to launch a product not what the supplier wants us to buy because of course every manufacturer wants you to buy the most that they can sell you they want every penny of your budget if they can get it 
Uh, also, the challenges we had on Alibaba was that not all the suppliers were, were really good about returning requests. You know, whenever we'd ask them questions and tell them we were interested in their product, and you know, they, they wouldn't respond quickly. Uh, when we tried to negotiate minimum order quantities, we we weren't able to move the needle as well as we wanted to. Uh, it took a long time to get quotes. Again, just dragging out that time frame to get a product launched, where we spend you know months, uh, weeks. With um, with these different suppliers, just trying to get to step one, which was agreeing on a price and an order quantity, so we could launch a product. That didn't work as well for us as dealing direct from China. Reason why? Well, when you're direct in China, one, you're looking at the the, the rep or the manufacturer or those people face to face. You have the product samples in your hand. You're not waiting for a sample to be shipped, paying 50 bucks. Or, or to get it DHL'd over so you can look at it and then trying to figure out how you can fix it or make it better or make it more personal for your business. You're there. You're looking at it. They're right there with you. You're checking out the product. You can ask questions right there. Hey, can you do this in a different color? Can you add my logo to it? Can you do this kind of a box? Can you customize it? What would it take to make happen? And you'd be surprised how fast and easy it is to customize a product and make a private label product when you're dealing face to face with these people right there in China. The other thing is, think about it. If you were willing to get on an airplane and go there and look at them face to face, you're considered a serious buyer. On Alibaba and these other online sales channels, they get thousands and thousands of requests for samples and better pricing. They're constantly being haggled to death. And, and how many of those actually turn into actual sales, to actual customers who buy, who become big buyers for these sellers? The, the percentages are extremely small, so they're a little bit jaded in dealing with people online because of all the, hey, send me five samples and give me a better price and, and I'll be a great customer, when in reality all, all it was was somebody who was trying to negotiate a better price for something so that they could give it away to friends or have it for themselves. I mean, you'd be surprised how much of that happens. So when you're looking at them and you're dealing with them real time, you're a serious buyer to them. You've just moved yourself out of the 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 uh, realm of a of a uh, of a person that they don't know to a person that they're just meeting for the first time. And in China, relationships are number one over everything else. So you've moved from a I don't know who you are or care who you are to, oh, look, this is a, an associate, a potential business partner. Partner, We can get to know each other. Maybe we can do good business together. Chinese are all about relationships, 100%. And the better your relationships, the better your friendships, the better your business with those manufacturers and distributors. In Alibaba, negotiation and product customization just takes a long time, guys. Before your goods finally arrive, like I said, we used to laugh. We used to say six months and $6,000, and you may get one private label product off of Alibaba and get it launched. And that's a lot of money to launch one product and a lot of time. There's all the back and forth. We already have a communication problem in most cases because they don't, they're, they, you know, they think and speak in their own language. And that can be very frustrating. There's a lot of misunderstandings. They take things very literally. A lot of words that we use don't translate correctly. So it can be very frustrating. But if you're directly there, typically the orders take, I mean, filling an order takes a matter of weeks or days in some cases. I mean, we've gone on sourcing trips where the first day or not, generally by the second day I'm placing orders. The first day I'm looking at products, but the second day I'm actually placing orders. And we order on the second day, and I'm only there for seven days, and by the third or fourth day, the products are showing up in my warehouse in China. They're already showing up because they're able to fill the orders that fast. That's not every product, but that's surprisingly a large number of products. So hopefully that's given you guys some good information on sourcing. You kind of see the reason why we look at sourcing direct as being better. You can save a lot of money. You're not paying that 30 to 40 percent uplift because you're buying it online, and you're speeding up the process. You know, the number one most important thing in everyone in the world's life is time. 
you can't buy it back. If you waste time, then you, you're never going to get it back. It's done. It's gone. You've thrown it in the garbage. You've wasted it in, in some form or fashion. So wasting time to me in business is the same way. If you waste time, your competitors are launching products against you. They get launched before you do. Guess what? They, they get market share. You don't. So speed to market is number one in today's society. And that is only getting faster, not slower. So we have to look at ways to be first to market, to be fast to market. Uh, that that you know that old slow method just doesn't work. So if uh, if there are any questions, Jeff, I mean, uh, definitely. Hopefully, you guys will stop about halfway through this. It is uh, got a lot of information, so it's going to be a nice long one. We'll probably start about stop about halfway and uh, about three or four more slide series, and then we'll take a few questions, take a little uh, a little break for questions and stuff like that, and then, because uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys will have a lot of them, and then we'll get back in it, finish it up, and then we'll open it up for Q&A again. I hope that's all right with you guys. So the next topic has to do with packaging, because once you've sourced the project, product, you need to have it in some type of a packaging, right? And when you package, package products for resale, that takes time, right? It has the same exact number of steps in creating, developing a package for a product as it does in developing the product itself. And it adds to the cost of the product, as well as the time frame in which you can launch it in. The same kind of things apply in packaging as they do in sourcing. On Alibaba, some of the manufacturers will help you with packaging, but there are some challenges with that. You know, you're going to have larger MOQs in boxes. Say you want to source 500 units because that's what you determined that you want to launch with, right? That's what that's what the market says you can you can buy as a minimum to launch a product and start making it successful. But you go to work with a manufacturer and the box company they're dealing with says that they only want to sell you 1,000 boxes. Well, now you've bought 500 extra boxes and you don't even know if that product's any good. So you got this MOQ problem and you also have a quality control problem. The same kind of quality control problems that you will have sourcing products online, you're going to have with your boxes. You know, you're going to buy it, you're going to have this sample, you're going to be in another country, you're going to look at that sample, you're going to ask them to make some adjustments, they're going to do it, but how do you QC it? Are you going to pay some other company to go and sit at the manufacturer and watch every product come through and spend extra time and money doing that? That can be kind of a hassle, and in some cases, it's very much recommended. If, if I'm buying any electronics at all, when I source and sell electronics, I have a... a I have my people at the manufacturer as they're running my products, pulling them off the line and testing them and making sure that they meet our QC standards. And we're testing and looking at things like, are they using the right capacitors in the boards? Or are they using the right transistors, resistors? Because from an electronics perspective, they, they'll cheapen the product by putting in a lower-end capacitor, and that lower-end capacitor will kill the power supply within a very short period of time, then that product dies, the customer's unhappy because they've had it for a week and then it's dead, right? That they, that those kind of things will happen, so you need to do it on that, right? But in other cases, that may not be the case. One of the cool parts about being direct with your packaging is that you're sourcing the product from the manufacturers, but also you'd be surprised where we go, how many box manufacturers are right there. So you can go and source the product, get the sample, and then go over to the box manufacturer and have them make a box and put your logo on it and get it done at the same time your product's done. Then send it to your manufacturer, and your manufacturer will package it in the box, and then they'll send it to our warehouse. It's crazy. So you can really, really, really see how this speeds up the process. It eliminates a lot of steps in the process, which also speeds up the time and helps you save money and time. So, you know, the cool part about being direct is, and I probably mentioned it, is you can see and touch and feel the package so you know the quality. I know one of the early products, I'll tell you the story, it's funny. One of the early products I did was a, uh, a textile product, you know, one of those compression sleeves deals that was out there. I did it pretty early on. I saw that it was kind of a fad product, and I knew that if I jumped in early, I could make a little more, bit of money, and then I'd just jump out, right, because it wasn't something I saw as a long-term business. Uh, or long-term product. 
And uh, so I went ahead and had the manufacturer do all the packaging and everything. I had a designer that I had, had, had hired to help us design the package, and I sent them the package dimensions and the design, but what you don't know will hurt you. And uh, the manufacturer said they were going to do it, and everything was good. And when the product arrived, there were two things that were a problem. The first thing was when the product was in the package already, it increased the amount, the, the amount of space that my products took up, which increased my shipping costs. That was kind of a negative. Uh, but I understood that, and I also understood that it would cost me money to package it here in the United States. So it was almost a wash there. But the, the other part that was bad was the cardboard box was so thin and so flimsy that it wouldn't stay closed. It wouldn't hold the product in it correctly, and it just looked extremely cheap and we we started selling it and the only complaints we got from customers online was hey the product's been really great but that packaging is terrible and I ended up sourcing an, uh, the package from a different company pulling all the product out of Amazon repackaging it in the new product uh, new packaging that we had made and then sending it back in increasing my cost of that product and lowering my profitability that's the first time and the last time I made that mistake. But it is something that happens, and this is things that you only learn through having experience. So hopefully my experience can help some of you avoid that type of a problem. But as you can see, being direct in China, being able to work with the package manufacturers directly, you can avoid a lot of these issues, and you can do this really quick. You can source a year, a year and a half, two years worth of products in one trip. It's just like that just based on whatever your budget is, right? So the next topic we'll go over is going to be shipping. And shipping is one that a lot of people just, they can't get their head around it. We get asked every single day, all day long about shipping. How does it work? What are all these costs? How does this, how does this happen? How, you know, how come it's so much? That's a, big, that's a big one for a lot of people. And it is probably the most expensive part of importing and selling online. Um, I would, we, let me think, we did uh, $1.5 million last year to FedEx. That's how much money we paid FedEx to ship products that we shipped directly to customers ourselves. And we did almost a million dollars with the United States Postal Service in direct sales. You know, and based on a $5 million business, you can see shipping costs eats up a huge, huge part. Overall, in my total business, shipping accounts for 25% of my top line revenue right off the bat. So out of the pie of 100% of the money we make, 25% of it is immediately gone to shipping. So I am constantly looking for ways to reduce shipping costs and increase efficiencies. Let's talk about some of the reasons why and some of the different shipping options that we have available today. Door-to-door -door shipping or what is called express shipping. These are companies like DHL, FedEx, UPS, right? Super fast. It's air, it's basically air freight, but uh, it's a little bit faster than traditional air freight uh, by a day, a couple of days. And although fast, you pay a massive premium by using these shipping methods to get your products back here to put them in to sell, to sell. And I don't care if you're in the UK or Australia or the US, there's a huge premium for using these express shipping, right? Uh, the second type of shipping is called air freight. And air freight is similar in speed to DHL, the express shipping. I mean, it's only a couple of days longer, right? Which is a really cool. You know, you can have your products in your, and prepping them and getting them into Amazon and get it ready to go in you know, like a week, six days. Uh, super fast, but about half the cost, right? But it has a lot of complexities. Uh, basically, air freight has the same complexities as ocean freight. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. We'll kind of go over it. But it tends to be very complex. There's a lot of paperwork, a lot of government regulations, a lot of steps in the process to make air freight or ocean freight happen. Ocean freight is by far the least expensive option. And there's two different types of ocean freight. There's LTC, which is less than container. 
And that's when you're shipping, you know, 10, 20, 50 cartons. You're shipping a pallet, two pallets, three pallets of products, right? That's an LTC. And then the other one is full container. When you're shipping a full container, they do have a cost difference. But ocean freight is about half the cost of air freight. Air freight is about half the cost of express shipping. So basically, ocean freight, LTC, is 25% of the cost of express shipping. So if you're express shipping today, if you can switch to ocean freight and learn how to manage your inventory, you can save 75% of your costs to land the product in the United States or in the UK or in Australia or any country that you're in by starting to learn how to use ocean freight. I exclusively use ocean freight for everything but samples today because it is the most efficient way and I hate giving money away that I need to build my business to shipping companies when there are other options on the table. So let's look at some examples. Uh, recently we shipped a thousand units for a customer. It was 22 cartons of products. There were a thousand units, they were real small, uh, and it cost about three thousand dollars. I rounded it up or down 10 or 20 bucks, not much, but I give this kind of gives you the example. So the total per unit shipping price for this customer was three dollars a unit, right? One thousand, three thousand dollars divided by one thousand, three bucks. So we also have done very recently some air freight for the same type of a, of, of a shipment. A thousand units, 22 cartons, same exact shipping, $1,400 plus local uh, the local delivery fee because when you use freight like Ocean Freighter or Air Freight, you don't have DHL driving the local delivery to you. You're going to pay to do that local delivery, but you're paying a massive premium for local delivery when you can do it via Air Freight and spend about $100 in local, in local delivery. You have some filing fees. This is part of those complexities. You have filing fees in China that you have to file and you have to pay for that paperwork to get done. It's about $65. You're going to pay for any pallets, about 10 to 15 bucks a piece, uh, plus or minus, but about 10 to 15 is an average. So let's say you know those 22 cartons were on two pallets. It's $30. And then you're going to have a warehouse fee because when they bring the product in on an airplane at the airport, they pull it off that airplane and they house it in a warehouse until you come or send someone to come and pick it up to do that local delivery piece and you're going to pay the warehouse money to warehouse it and protect it you know organize it for you so if we look at the total for air freight shipping we're looking at one thousand six hundred and eighty five dollars for a thousand units or basically a dollar sixty nine per unit so you can see right off the bat we've cut our shipping price in just about half just by doing that now let's look at the same thing with ocean freight and this will be LTC less than container so 1,000 units, 22 cartons, that's going to be one CBM. It's basically one and a half pallets or maybe one large pallet, uh, depending on the size of the cartons. And so one CBM is $110. That's the freight part of it. All right? You're going to have all the same pieces as air freight. So you're going to have the $100 local delivery. That doesn't change. You're going to have the filing fees in China. That's $65. You're going to have the same pallet charges, and you're going to have the warehouse fee at the port. Every city has a port, even if they're not in by an ocean, they're going to have a port, and generally that port is basically where all the freight coming into that city uh, lands. So if we look at those costs and we add them together, the total to the ocean freight was $385, or $0.39 cents per unit in shipping. So we're talking 10% of the cost of door-to-door -door express shipping to use ocean. But most people are afraid of ocean because of the long lag times. They're afraid of how much time it's going to take, and they don't understand how to manage uh, their inventory ordering processes. This is something we do every single day, is manage and deal with our ordering processes on inventory. And it's really not that hard. I've broken it down into a very simple formula that you can use to make it happen. And the cool part is, if you're saving 39 cents per unit in shipping, how much more product can you buy? Instead of giving the money away for shipping, why don't you use that to buy more product? More product equals more sales opportunities equals more profit. So that's kind of the way I look at it and you know, try to help people out understand 
how that shipping can really affect your business. And if you think about it, we talked about winning on the buy, right? Well, part of the buy is shipping. If you add three dollars per unit, or let's just even a dollar, if you add a dollar a unit to ship your product into the country to get it in the country to sell, and it costs you a dollar for that unit, now it actually the buy cost, the actual true cost of that product is two dollars, right? And you still have some other charges too. So we're going to go over those, but just basic simple math says now that product cost me two dollars. Well, somebody else who's buying that same product or a similar product that's shipping it ocean, it costs them a buck thirty-nine. They are sixty-one cents cheaper than you, right? So what does that mean? That means they can sell that product sixty-one cents cheaper than you can because you have sixty-one cents more cost involved in that product because you gave it to the shipper instead of being able to use that as an advantage on your side in selling. These are the things that a lot of these gurus can't teach you because they really don't know it. And they're going to recommend fast over efficient. Well, what I like to do is fast and efficient. And there are other places you can save time that will help you be more efficient. But at the same time, save yourself a lot of money and be more competitive. So hopefully you guys got that. If there are any questions, you guys, please go ahead and uh, ask those. We're going to go and talk about prepping products here in a second. Do you think this is a good place to go? To? I'm not even looking at the clock, Jeff. Is this a good place to do some Q&A or any questions, or should we just keep on rolling it? No, man, I think we should We should keep rolling. We don't really have uh, uh, very many questions, so let's keep rolling. Uh, yeah. You know how a lot of times in your – and you're, well, what that tells me is you're answering a lot of questions about this. And as you know, as you roll through these, you, you're so detailed, man. I mean, you, you know, you'll answer a lot of the questions, but then, you know, there will be some things that people will ask probably yeah, true. You know, by the time. True, true. Yeah, that, and that makes sense. That makes sense. And I know that some people, their, their minds are exploding probably right now. By the time we finish, they'll be like, I didn't really know this. I, I, I honestly believe it, guys. And I'm going to try to break it up a little bit so that it'll be a little bit less uh, taxing. But hopefully this is a really good education because, see, I have no, I have absolutely zero reason to not tell you the truth, right? I have zero reason to not be honest and show you the realities of what this looks like because you're not buying a membership into my club where I'm going to sell you information on how great everything is. Business is great, and this business can change your life if you do it right. It's huge. It's a gold mine of opportunity. It has changed my life. I own a plane that costs more than most people's houses. You know, and I'm not trying to brag, but I'm trying to say I would have never been able to do that before. I mean, the phone company paid me well, but not that well. You know, um, this this changes lives. This this funds college for kids. You know, you can pre-fund your children's uh, uh, college accounts and not worry about the cost of college for your kids, not mortgage your home to the hilt to help cover their school costs and things like that. This can, for people in college, this can pay for your college. This can change lives and I see it happening a lot, but it only changes lives if you know the whole picture, if you understand, uh, uh, you have a decent understanding of all the steps. You don't have to know the whole picture, and I really don't want you to think you have to become this expert and study everything that's happening. I'm, the, you know, I'm going into some decent detail, but there's still a lot more to go on. I'm just trying to show you guys the truth and help you really be able to make intelligent choices when building your business, because that's the important part, right? So let's talk about duty in the United States or in the UK or anywhere else. Governments live off the money they take from the rest of us, right? and all the governments want a piece of their pie. There are some tricks that people use, and I'm going to talk about them, and the reason I'm going over this is because I want to really drill this point home. I've seen this happen, and I don't want it to happen to you. Right off the bat, it's best to accommodate the government in the country that you live in and pay them what is owed to them rather than trying to get around loopholes or try shady tricks to avoid paying taxes. This is a business-ending trick. 
and I see it happen. I've seen it happen multiple times. I've seen it happen recently with someone who came from a different group used our prep center. We have a lot of people who aren't part of the GDW Mastermind. They're not part of our inner circle uh, that come from other places because we have a, 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 recognize, a very well-recognized third-party logistics center, and they come and things happen to them. And even recently, I've seen somebody have all their product seized, and they're not allowed, they can't sell anything, and they can't even get their product because they try to play tricks with the commercial invoices and the price that they were going to pay in taxes uh, to the government. So how do we avoid that? Well, there's something in the United States called an HS code. And again, I'm, I can't go over all the details in the value-added taxes in Europe because I'm not as familiar with that. I would recommend that you get a tax expert in the country that you're going to sell in and make sure you understand what needs to happen before you do it. But here in the yeah, U.S., there's an HS. Yeah. I don't yeah. interrupt you, but I think. I think we'd stop there on the prepping and we talked about maybe stopping and answering some questions and then you went to the next slide. I don't, we, we've got people saying, Hey, wait, right. what happened to the prepping stuff? Whoops. Yeah. I apologize. I must've clicked the, <laughs> the button. Thanks guys. I appreciate that, man. Well, hey, you know, it's live when I mess up like this. <laughs> we do. Oh, not man, that's crazy. Well, we are, we are running our businesses all day long. We do not rehearse. <laughs> Yeah, this is live. You know, this is not not Memorex, right? The old saying, live and not Memorex, right? All right, prepping our products. So once we get those products shipped into the United States or into UK or EU or Australia or wherever, South America, um, we have to get them ready to go to sale. And just about every logistics company, every 3PL like GDW or Amazon with their Fulfilled by Amazon, which is basically one of the world's largest third-party logistics centers, um, they have some type of preparation. The products have to be prepared to be in their warehouse, not to be shipped necessarily, but to be warehoused. And that's because warehouses are big and they're not air conditioned 99.9% .9 of the time and they are dirty and birds fly around in the top of them and mice scurry along the bottom, right? So they want the products prepped so that they are in pristine condition all the time. So when they send them to customers, customers don't say, hey, why is this thing all dirty and dusty like it's been in some warehouse, right? So how much money, how much time and effort you put into prepping your products really depends on how much time you've put in on the front side of your, bit of your product and how much of that product you ship. And what that really means is, you know, if you go to China and you meet with a supplier and you place an order for a product and you get the packaging done and you have your logo put on it and then you have, say, the, for example, a UPC code if you're selling it like in Walmart's online uh, sales center or uh, on like e or through eBay or through something like that, or the FSNKU, which is Amazon's version of a UPC that they use to manage their warehouse. And you have to put that code. So you get, the more of that you get done on the front end, the less of it you have to get done on the back end, and the cheaper it is, and the faster some things naturally go too. But that costs money, and it also costs time. And what are we talking about here? We're talking about what I call the quick launch process. Why? Because I know that I need to be on my sales channel with that product before 50 or 60 other people are there or 200 or 300, 50 or 60 isn't a big deal. But I'm kind of using it as an example. I need to be early to market with the product as fast as possible. I need to determine if the product is a winner and then I worry about improving things like retail packaging. Then I worry about improving those aspects. So what I try to do is prep my products in the most cost effective and cheapest method possible up front when I'm first launching the product. After I've launched it and I know that the product is going to be successful and it's starting to generate money, it's actually making money, at that point when I start reordering product, I start improving it. So I naturally improve the products as the product starts moving and selling. That way I'm not spending a bunch of time and money trying to put out a perfect retail product in the very beginning only be one late to market and I've got way too many competitors which weren't there six months ago 
and two, I'm not investing as much capital in doing that, so I can invest my capital in products that are actually making me money versus products that I'm just launching and trying out in the market to see if they're going to be those winners that 10x or 20x my money. And this isn't just in products, right? I do this throughout my business all the time. We actually had a meeting here uh, yesterday, last night, uh, after after we uh, we closed out. We stayed till about 7 o'clock p.m. last night uh, meeting with my employees, and we were looking at our uh, document flow processes. And why? Because it's constantly, as your business grows, as it gets bigger, as it scales, you need to improve your processes. You need to change things. You need to add steps in the process or remove them. So you're always looking at how you can improve it. Same thing with your listings. If you're listing products online, you're going to always be looking at how you can improve what's doing well for you. You're constantly testing and improving. Well, that's the same thing with a product. Launch first, make it better. Launch it, move it, make it better all the time. Example, let's say we got new product one. We launch it, we have, we have no packaging, we got a poly bag, we need the uh, UPC or FSNKU, and by law in the United States, you need to have the country of origin made in China, made in Mexico, made in Canada, wherever it may be. Even if it's made in the USA, by law, uh, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol law, you have to have that uh, visible on the product. Uh, also, things like suffocation warning labels need to be available. They need to either be printed on the bags or stuck on uh, how that happens. And, and then other things that you have for prepping your products, inspecting for damage and shipping, which will occur. Damage and shipping is just a normal part of business. Uh, LTC damage and express shipping damage, 10% or greater. So if you're getting 10% of your products damaged, and not the physical product as much as the retail packaging gets damaged, uh, if you're having 10% of your packaging damaged by shipping and that higher cost shipping, funny, you pay more money and you get worse service, right? Um, but if that's happening, how are you accounting for it? Are you having to pay someone to repackage it? Do, do you have the boxes so that you can repackage it? These are additional costs that you're going to have in that, in that product. So new product one, let's say your additional costs are about $1.50 per product. Well, you bought that product for a dollar. Let's say you bought that product. Let's say it cost you five bucks. You know, you bought it on Alibaba, and it cost you five bucks. And they had it shipped, and you had to do all this extra stuff. So you add another six dollar, a dollar fifty on it. Now all of a sudden, the actual true cost is six dollars and fifty cents, right? You've added another dollar fifty in cost on the product. Now, in a brand new product that I'm just launching, I'm keeping the packaging and other pieces to a minimum. I'll probably incur something in that dollar a pack a dollar a product range add on price uh, to cover it so I can launch my product. I don't see that as being a big deal. It costs us a dollar. If we've priced it right, if we've bought it right, if our shipping is right, we're we're saving enough money that the dollar really doesn't matter as much. But if you're paying too much for shipping already, if you're already doing all the retailing and you still are adding that additional cost on, well then it still starts to drive those prices up. So we need to manage it. So let's look at new product number two. This is maybe a product that's improved over time. It's maybe your second order of that product, not your first order. And you've already designed and put in some retail packaging. But even the retail packaging per Amazon FBA guidelines needs a poly bag if there's an opening where the product is exposed. Or it needs the lid sealed so that you can grab the box and physically shake it and the product won't fall out of the the box. Those, I mean, Amazon actually has very explicit details on how the packaging needs to be done to go into their stuff. And they have shake tests, drop tests, other things that need to happen. So you're going to have a little bit of charges on that. But everything else is printed on the box, that UPC or FSNKU, you're made in China, any of the warning labels, all that stuff happens. So now all of a sudden, all you're doing is a little bit of box replacement to shipping damage. Remember we talked about that. And potentially a lid seal, maybe a bo maybe a poly bag, maybe not, you know, if you've done some good work there. And now all of a sudden your additional cost per unit is like forty eight cents instead of a dollar fifty. What have you done? You just saved yourself a buck oh two on the product. What can you do with a dollar two? Buy more products, pay for more marketing, and sell more products. So, you know, I own a prep company, yes. Hey, I'd love to charge you a buck and a half. 
But in reality, what I want to show you how to do is be successful. Because if I can get you to sell, you know, 30, 40, 50 units a day of a product, or even 10 units a day, it's 300 units a month, right? Where are you going to ship that product? If I help show you how to save this money and how to do this, you're going to ship it to us. Am I going to be the one that gets to make the 48 cents? Because, you know, if you're sending me 300 units plus a month, or 1,000 units a month, or 10,000 units a month, um, and we can make that money, then, A, everybody's winning, right? I've showed you how to save money. I've helped you grow your business, and you, in turn, allow me to make a little bit of money as well, right? All right, back to the fun one. Duty, taxes, value-added taxes. Like I was saying earlier, man, accommodate the government. Uh, there is a, a saying that has been around for... To over 2,000 years, and it's give Caesar what is Caesar's, or what is due Caesar. And basically, that's great advice. And what it meant was, hey, you know what? The money has the logo name of the country that it comes from, and they make their money through taxes. Trying to play games with them when they make their money is a big mistake. So you want to avoid your goods being seized, you want to avoid big fines, big, big fines, and even criminal prosecution for uh, tax fraud and things like that. Just pay the taxes. But if you don't know how to look that up, if you don't know how to find out what those taxes are, then you can set yourself up for a problem because taxes can vary. I mean, there are products that you can ship in the United States to sell that have zero taxes. All you do is pay a simple filing fee of $25, to U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, and you're done. There's no other tax. And you can look that up and find that out by looking up the HS code and looking at places like dutycalculator.com uh, and other sites where you can, uh, Duty Calculator I think is a paid site. Uh, there are other places you can look that up. Even the government has it. You can get it through the U.S. government. Uh, and we're kind of talking about the U.S. right now, but you can even look it up in the U.S. government. I don't know if other governments have the same thing where you can look up what that import tax or those import fees are going to be. And so it could be a zero one up to 25%. I've seen them as high as 49%. In some medical devices that we've imported into the United States, the tax was almost 50% of the invoiced whole, uh, uh, cost of the product. So it's not 25% of what you sell it for. It's 25% of what you paid for it. So if you paid a dollar, it was 25 cents. Or if you if it was 50, you know, a 49 cent tax, it was 49 cents out of every dollar you paid for the product. So take the time to ensure that you're using the right HS code. Um, you can you can miss miss you you can accidentally, and this happens sometimes, and it's never really on purpose, but you can accidentally use the wrong HS code for a product. Uh, I had a product that was um, was mis miscoded and the tax was like like 18%. And I went back and looked and the HS code for that product should have been a zero dollar, a 25%, a $25 filing fee charge. And I had to go back and say, hey, this is mislabeled. But the government came back and basically, you know, tried to tell me no, it wasn't. And I had to show them that it was and be able to provide the details and things like that to make sure it happens. But I've also seen people mislabel it uh, in the other direction trying to cheapen it and ended up the government changed it to a more expensive one. In our case we actually mislabeled it to the more expensive one I had to go back and get him to go in the other direction. And trust me, once the government gets your money and it's really hard to do that. <laughs> so make sure that your HS codes are correct and the other part that's important is ensuring that your invoices are correct. And this is a huge challenge uh, for anybody when you're sourcing because the Chinese people will to, it's not they're not doing it on purpose remember they're a different country a different society they think differently than we do so I will call something a toothpick and they'll call it a wooden skewer thing or a wooden stick or or maybe they'll call it a bamboo stick well the HS code for a for a raw bamboo or a bamboo stick versus the HS code for a finished toothpick is different and the taxes levied on those can be different and I'm using it as an example but I'm trying to help you understand making sure that the description on that invoice is 
appropriately described. So not only do they look at how much you're bringing in and the weight and the quantity and the dollar figure, but they also look at the description of the product. And if the description is vague uh, and generic and doesn't tell what material it's made out of, you're asking yourself to have some challenges with duty and taxes. So ensuring those things happen correctly saves you a lot of time and headaches later on down the road. It also speeds up the shipping because your product doesn't get stuck in customs while they're asking you questions so they can appropriately uh, categorize and determine that the taxes are correctly levied because they're going to get their tax money, right? Give Caesar what is Caesar's. It's great advice. All right, so the next thing we're going to go over, we're going to talk about marketing, right? And, you know, the taxes, basically the advice is understand what you're doing, make sure you understand the HS code, do it right, and pay the government wherever it is the money that's owed them so that you have less pro less problems. Less Hassles are time wasters. They pull you away from running your business. What you need to focus on is running your business, not working in your business, right? So let's look at the marketing side. Now, <laughs> I, I'll admit to this, and I'm really not, not proud of it anymore, but I was proud of it back then. I have started multiple companies and launched multiple products with a $0 marketing budget than anyone else I know. I would launch a product, and I would account for $0 in marketing. And I, I read a book back in the... Uh, middle to late 80s called, uh, it was called, it was about guerrilla marketing. Actually, I think it might have been called the guerrilla marketing. Uh, I, I still actually have the book, my bookshelf, my business bookshelf. And it talks about lots of different ways to market on the cheap, to, uh, to, to get free publicity for your business, your company, your product without spending a lot of money. And so I would set zero dollar marketing budgets and use different things to try to generate cash. And early on in the two thousand, you know, the later two thousands, man, online was the greatest way to do that. Facebook, Twitter, when they first came on, they weren't figuring it out, and we could use those tools uh, almost exclusively for free, and 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 run around and shout at the world and tell them about our product or or our business, and it was cheap and and inexpensive, and it was it was basically free. It didn't cost us anything. So I did all these great products without spending money to market. Now, 30 years later, I've learned one thing. If I would have spent money on marketing those products and those businesses, they would have done substantially better than they did. Because with the right marketing, you even expand the reach of your business. More people see you, know who you are, understand what you can do for them understand your value proposition, your benefit statements, your mission statements, and they can align themselves with you. If you don't spend money on marketing, well then fewer people are going to see you. They're, fewer people are going to know that you even exist. Uh, one of the sayings in that guerrilla marketing book was, he who makes the most dollars is the one who climbs up a tree and hollers. And it was a funny rhyme, and I thought that's kind of funny, but I really get it now. You know, the guy who's really killing it is the guy who knows how to market his products. And there's several different forms of marketing today when we talk about online marketing. Uh, one of the fastest, one of the ones recently, and this is very recently, we're talking within the last year, year and a half, uh, uh, are, are the promotions. Big time promotional discounts and giveaways to promote the, pro the product and gain market recognition. And uh, promotions are great, and they definitely have a place, and they actually really do work. But you have to account for that in your marketing budgets, because if you're going to give away a bunch of products, you know, you have a cost in that product, that's part of your marketing budget. You need to take that into account in how much product you order as to how much you're going to give away to promote the product and start to gain that recognition, and by gaining recognition, gain organic sales. The pro, super fast rate ranking, great product. Buzz. The con, depending on the market giveaway, it can cost you thousands of dollars. And I'll tell you a story about my own personal business. Many of you know we were the reason we did direct fulfilled by merchant is because we sold food and supplements. And those are things that don't do well in a hot warehouse 
and Amazon during the summer months. So I built my own warehouse with climate control areas to house those products so that they would do better in the hot summer months in Texas, but also so that we could just ship and fill that all year long. Well, the supplement business is a shark tank. Uh, it's huge. The dollars in supplements are very large. And the giveaways today and promotions in supplements on Amazon are borderline insane. Um, to gain rank in, um, you know, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say Ginkle Biloba, but just insert whatever the most common recent Dr. Oz talked about uh, supplement is today, and there are people selling it on Amazon, and they're giving it away through promotions to the tune of forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of product giveaways because the upside is in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So those promotions are great, but depending on what market you're in, if you don't understand it, they can eat your lunch. So understanding how those type of promotions work is really important. It is one of the things that we teach and go over very, very, uh, in a very detailed manner, showing you how to understand that when you go to one of the events that we put on, be it our mastermind. And if you're invited to our mastermind, we definitely go over it in extreme detail there. Uh, as well as some of the newer marketing techniques that we're using. But also, if you go to us uh, with us on one of our China trips, we're going to go over that because you need to understand it before you even start sourcing your products. Uh, the next marketing uh, technique that we'll talk about is PPC. And I I'm, remember I've been doing this a long time, so I, I think you know I have pay-per-click marketing on the brain. And so Google AdWords, been around forever, pay-per-click. They are the guys that invented it, pay to get traffic. You pay for every click that comes to look at your product. Well, Amazon and now even eBay and many of the other sales channels are saying, wow, people will pay us for that? Great. So now that's a, that's, I, I will use PPC even when I'm talking about Amazon's marketing service, which is AMS. But I'm going to use PPC. I just wanted to make sure you guys know that so that I wasn't confusing anybody and any of you that knew about Amazon's marketing service were, were, wasn't thinking that I was nuts. <laughs> so anyway, um, so pay-per-click, we're going to talk about that. You know, you, basically, you're paying for traffic to the site, right? You're paying for clicks. So they're going to give you impressions. For those of you who don't know that, an impression is they're going to show your product to a customer through an impression on a web page. And the customers are going to see that product, so they're going to they're, they're going to say, "Okay, look, we've showed your product to a customer ten thousand times, and five people clicked, and we're going to charge you for every click." And most of the time, these pay per clicks are based on a bid system, so you're going to bid for those clicks. In highly competitive markets, those bids can be a dollar, two dollars, five dollars. Right now, it's fairly cheap. It's still sub one dollar most of Amazon, but in very competitive areas. It's substantially more. Why would you pay for those clicks? Well, if somebody's looking and sees your ad for your product and you've done it right, this is somebody who's looking to buy. Yes, I'll pay for that click for them to come and buy my product. And the cool part is you're paying for only traffic that clicks on your ad. You're only paying for traffic that is looking for what you have to sell. The con is if if you do it right, I will let me let me let me caveat that by saying, if you do it right, that's what you get. The con is, if you do it wrong, you're going to get traffic that isn't looking for what you have at all. You're going to get a lot of it, and you're going to spend a whole lot more money on people who weren't looking to buy what you had in the first place. So you will burn money that way. So you need to make sure that when you're doing pay-per-click and you're doing this, you do it right. It's something that we teach. We have webinars on it for our mastermind group. Uh, I have I'm happen to be friends with one of the best and probably top ranked global pay per click experts in the world, Brian Johnson. He's a friend of mine. He he's he lives in Austin, not too far from where I'm at, and uh, and has been a coach in our mastermind many many times. Uh, great guy, super smart. We have a lot of extremely detailed information that we provide in our trips and on our masterminds on how to do this. Let's look at some examples. So let's do, we're doing our Amazon uh, Amazon marketing service. We're doing some pay-per-click with them. And if you do it well, 
you can do it for like three to four percent of your sales meaning to sell one product it costs only three to four percent of that top line revenue so that's three cents out of every dollar is your marketing cost to sell something right if done wrong you can actually spend 200 to 300 percent or more of the sale price of that item you're selling it for a dollar it costs you three dollars to do it that's kind of a loser we don't want to do that right now let's look at uh, but it, let's look at like Facebook advertising right here's another one this is a another subject here right Facebook advertising today right now super 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 cheap to advertise on Facebook the problem is even though they have more faces globally looking at Facebook than than just about any place else um, their advertising volume uh, as far as the number of clicks that you get is going to be substantially lower so it's going to be a lower volume but it's going to be super cheap but as with any advertising if you know your audience you maximize your effectiveness you can do that you can really make some things happen Facebook is up and coming I look at Facebook as a great place to start really making some strides and the people who figure out Facebook are going to make a ton of money because Facebook is has the potential to be massive bigger than Amazon uh, so it's really good we're investing a lot of time effort and money in using Facebook advertising to direct traffic and using Facebook advertising to sell directly to consumers um, I think that's a great place to look and it is super inexpensive so you don't spend a whole lot of money to do a lot there it's a great place to make it happen there are other forms of marketing as well advertising in magazines uh, you know billboards television commercials many many different ways direct to consumer telemarketing I owned uh, to, I owned 150 seat telemarketing room in Houston Texas in the 1980s all the way through the mid uh, all the way through the mid 90s and only after that did I convert over and start doing technology and uh, other stuff uh, and and e-commerce and uh, so you know I know that telemarketing is is a very viable way to sell products but not all products fit in that I'm going to talk more about things that are actually um, appropriate to what we see as uh, an effective way to market uh, for e-commerce and using the internet which is the cheapest and largest source of traffic uh, in the world and so uh, that's why we probably don't, we don't cover that kind of stuff all right I'm gonna take a drink real quick and then we can go over the selling products part how are we doing Jeff doing well man people still, caught you napping people still oh caught me muted caught me uh caught me muted kind of got a cold coming on so uh oh, um, not good, not good. Sorry to hear that, man. Well, it's now, you, good, know, you know, you know, you got the basketball team over here with all the kids. They're always passing something around, pun intended. Yeah, definitely, that's it. So, guys, this is the fun part, right? This part right here, Jeff. I know for you and me and everybody else and anybody who's brand new and just starting, the very first product you ever sell is probably the most exciting time in your life. At that point, you go from doubting that this works to, oh my God, I think I can make some money doing this. It, it's like, it's an out-of-body experience, and it really is super exciting for all of us. I, I, I don't get excited on that as much, but I still get excited every time I launch a new product and it starts doing really well. It's like, man, I knew that one was good. you know. And it's kind of a bummer on the ones that die, like, hmm, I thought that was going to be a winner, but it's not. You know, after you've done this for a while, it, it's uh, it's a little different. Now it's like, man, I knew I could make a million dollars more in my business today. You know, so but uh, but it changes. It's still exciting. I still love the the, the selling process online. I still love it when people uh, buy products from me off off of any of our sales channels, and I really love launching brand new brands and brand new categories and brand new areas. But sales, and when you start selling products, man, you really you you've proved it, right? People have and they're buying what you want, what you thought was good. And sales generate money, right? They generate that cash flow. And businesses survive and thrive on cash flow, right? If your business is not generating cash, it will not survive. And if your business isn't generating large volumes of cash at a profit, it can't thrive. 
So you need those sales to make it happen. But what you need to realize is sales cost money. Let's look at some examples here. So you got this product, right? And the cost of your product landed with shipping, taxes, preparation, everything. That's your product cost. Then you have a sales fee. And we're going to use eBay and Amazon because those are the big boys, but Amazon being the big one. And my experience is right now being super efficient and smart, understanding how to do eBay, uh, we, it costs us about 9% uh, to sell on eBay, meaning we have to pay eBay 9 cents of every dollar we sell for on eBay. And Amazon, on an average, it can be less or more depending on the categories and what you're selling. But for me today, on an average, Amazon is double the price of eBay, 18% is my average cost uh, in fees to Amazon to sell on that. So now we have these product costs, my landed shipping tax and fees, we have our sales fees, and we have those shipping fees, right? Not the shipping as in freight, but the shipping as in shipping it to the customer. See, I remember when you could actually charge for shipping, and it was okay, and people were willing to pay it. But because of Amazon Prime, because of a lot of people jumping on the free shipping bandwagon, uh, now today everybody's shipping needs to be free. Well, what that has done is it eats into your margin. Most people were smart in the beginning, and they just added the shipping to the cost of the product. Well, there's two things wrong with that. If you sold the product for 10 bucks and you added $3 in shipping, you just sold the product for $13, right? Guess who gets... 9 to 18% of $13, not 9 to 18% of $10. The company, your sales channels, eBay and Amazon, that's why Amazon and eBay promoted it. That's why they pushed so hard for most of us to do free shipping. That's why they gave us more traffic to our products if we offered free shipping because ultimately Amazon and eBay get paid on the shipping costs as well. Most people who don't understand business made a mistake. They didn't calculate those costs into that shipping fee, and they ended up charging too little, and it ate 9 to 18% more of the shipping fee out of the margins that they made on their product. And, guys, the bigger you get, the, 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 the larger these numbers are. Being smart, looking at things on a per-unit basis, you manage your costs on a per-unit basis. You manage your company on a larger do on the, on the dollar value of the total dollar. Right, but you manage products and fees on the, 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 those costs. So shipping's free. We have to eat the shipping one way or another. Now, hopefully, we're smart enough that we calculate that and add it into the sale price of the product that we're selling it for, so that we can cover those shipping costs and we don't give it away out of the profits that we need to make to have a successful business that can grow and thrive. Right? Because cash flow is king, and profits keep us growing. So the bigger you get the more that that costs. We have to think about those sales costs when we think about selling our products. We have to add that into the cost of the, the product. It's the, called the cost of sale, or it goes in the accounting as COS, or cost of sale. So we have the cost of the product, our products in good costs. We have the cost of sale. We have our marketing and advertising components. All those have to be accounted for when we're selling products so that we know how to price it right. See, we don't want to run... A lot of people online keep lowering their prices all the time, and that's a race to the bottom of profits. And real quickly, it gets to be a race to the bottom of negative money, meaning you're selling the product, but you're actually losing money every time you sell it. That's a quick way to go out of business, and it's not something you want to do if you're looking to change your life in a business, right? If you're looking to build something good, you want to make sure that you understand these principles so that these principles will help you thrive and grow. The next principle we're going to talk about is restocking, and this one doesn't get talked about enough, and I think it's a challenge. This is probably one of the number one areas that, you know, I see a lot of new businesses fail. They go out there, they spend all their money on this one product, and they package it perfectly, they spend all their money up front, they, they buy a ton of product, and they can't restock it. And, you know, you don't get your money instantly when somebody buys it. There's a lag between the time it is purchased to the time it's delivered, to the time you actually get paid. And, and that lag can kill you because you can launch a product 
and sell it out and then not have the cash for three, four weeks, 90 days. If you're in retail, 120 day net is not an uncommon thing. You know, you're talking four months before you see a check. So it's four months before you can pay your supplier to resupply you. You can't stay in business that way. Amazon will actually look at that as a negative if you can't restock your products and they will not, they will reduce your rank. They won't show your product as much because they don't trust that you're going to keep their customers happy. So to get, when you want to get a product moving and then you go out of stock, why does that happen? You don't have cash to resupply, right? You don't understand there's a delay from when you sell it to when you get the money. We just talked about that, right? Delays of just weeks can kill you if you're cash strapped in a brand new business. So you need to understand and manage this and it has to do with poor product management habits. Failure to take into account the complete product life cycle costs you time, money, and I see businesses go out of business a lot. So let's look at examples of this, right? I don't want this to happen to you guys. This is something that I can help you with a lot. GDW and my company, we do this very, very well. So let's say you have a product and you sell 10 of these widgets every day. That's 300 widgets a month on an average, right? Let's say it takes the manufacturer 21 days to make that product and seven days to get it on the, to ship it door to door. Remember that one, door to door, the super expensive shipping? So now you got 30 more days to prep, manufacture, and ship, right? So the total is we're looking at over 30 days before you can get that product in your hands from the time you order it. So you have a 30-day lag time. Let's look at a couple of examples. And this is, this is very common, guys. This 30-day lag is not unusual. And if you ship Ocean like I do, it's actually more like 45 days, not 30 days. It's a 45-day lag. But I save a ton of money. But let's be smart about it and look at Johnny Ecom. Johnny Ecom buys 100 units because his guru, Joe, says that that's the right thing to do. Guru Joe's an expert. He's been in business all of about a year. He's 23 years old, and he has all that experience, right? So he teaches his buddy Johnny here how to do this. Johnny buys 100. He's selling 10 a day. He sells out in 10 days because the product is hot, but he has it in stock. Well, Johnny goes back, back to the supplier to reorder after he gets paid two weeks later. How long has it been? 60 days, right? He bought it, took 30 days to get it. Took him 30 days. He orders his first 100 units. It gets 30 days before he gets it. He pays way too much in shipping. Now he sells it out. Two weeks later, he gets paid 60 days, basically, in, uh, to get it in stock. Um, if Ocean, it's definitely 60 days. Well, it takes the manufacturer their time. You got the shipping time. You got all that, and now you're back another 30 days. Johnny's been out of stock for over 30 days. His sales are now super slow. He doesn't know why or what to do to fix it. And guess what? Guru Joe doesn't either. See, Amazon looks at you, and they look to see, and I'm going to use them as an example, but they're not the only one. Sears will look at you. Anybody, Any sales channel that's worth a darn is going to look at you to see if you're going to keep product in stock. Because if you're a good supplier with a good product and you constantly have it in stock, they control the traffic, and they will send the traffic to you. If you're in and out of stock and you're bouncing up and down, well, what they do is through their algorithms, they look at you and they see that and they say, hey, this is not a reliable seller. They have a product people want, but they're not reliable. So we're going to give them a lower ranking and we're going to send them lower traffic. Let's look at a different example. Billy Econ, he did his homework. He used GDW. Hey, and that's a self, uh, you know, that's a selfless plug. I'll take that, right? <laughs> it's, it was kind of a joke. I like to play. I like to have a little bit of fun while we're working here, right? So, Billy Ecom news GDW, and we told him to buy a thousand units because we looked at it and saw that there was ten units a day in sales volume ahead of time before he ever ordered. So he launched with three hundred units as his promo to rank his product, and Amazon said, "Man, this guy rocks. He's promoted out three hundred units. His sales are hitting ten sales a day really quick." And he has enough inventory to hold him over for about 45 days after giving, actually longer than that, about 60 days after giving away 300 units, right? But he went ahead and ordered 300 more after he started hitting his 10 sales a day organically because he knew it would take 30 days of manufacturing. He's going to save money in ocean shipping, and that's going to take him 30 days, and he has 45 days in inventory in case of delays. So basically, Billy never runs out of stock. Johnny can't come back in and take that market share away from Billy because Amazon says Billy's our supplier. 
he doesn't run at a stock we like him, and we're going to keep him sending him traffic. Johnny can't get his market back. Johnny had the market, but because he didn't do it right, Johnny lost the market to Billy, and Billy now owns it. Poor Johnny, man. Should have used GDW, right? And listen to someone who really knows how to make this work. Well, warehousing products is very much the same way. Like the example of Johnny and Billy being able to warehouse goods needed to be able to cover sales over a period of time, 30 days, sales cycles, 45 days in stock, all that kind of stuff, is a cost. It's something you need to think about when you're building your business, right? Initially, in the beginning, you probably do it out of your house, and you're buying 100, 200 units, and you're ready to make it happen. And you don't want to spend the cash every month to build this big warehouse, and which will grow, by the way. It'll grow, and it'll grow, and it'll keep on growing. Every two years, we doubled in size in, in our facilities from the day we started selling on Amazon. Every two years, my warehouse doubles in size, except for this year. This is my second year in the facility we're in right now, and it looks like this year our projected goal is five times larger than we were this year, next year. So I'm not going to double my warehouse this year. My, uh, my lease is up in October, and I'm looking at 5x the space that we had before. This is a cost. Is this something that you want to do? You know, most people want to build an e-commerce business because it's easy, because they can do it from home. They don't need to hire a bunch of people. They don't need a big staff. The reality is if you're going to do this all on your own, if you're not going to partner with companies like GDW, if you're not going to outsource the grunt work, then you are going to build that. I know I did it. You know, I, Don't make the mistakes I made. Um, so so the best way to make that, the most cost-effective way to do that, especially if you're small and if you want to keep your team really small and you big company that does large volume and pays you a big paycheck, but you don't want to have to hire. You want to be able to travel whenever you want to. You want to be able to do those things. You're going to want to partner with a company and outsource the grunt work. Uh, I tell people a lot of times, man, you, as the owner of your business, when you're starting out, you need to be the strategic mind. You need to be the chief executive officer. You need to work on things that build your business not work on things in your business. If you are a businessman today and you have a business and that business relies on just you and if something happened to you, that business is gone, then you don't have a business. You have a job and it has more responsibility, more liability than working for the corporation. A real business can survive and run without, with, with any single member of that business missing. If my business is gone, my employees know how to do the job. They could continue running it. There are other people, part of that team that I showed you guys in the beginning, that could take over my spot if they needed to. But, you know, but, but hopefully they don't. <laughs> But, it, I mean, that's when you start looking at a real business. And for things that we don't do that aren't part of our, uh, our core competency, we partner with other companies. You know, we partner with uh, uh, Hyundai to, to, to deliver containers to us in China, to our warehouse there. Because we don't want to be a container company. That's not our core competency. But we need containers to do part of the business that we do. So, in, in the case of an e-commerce business, if you're focusing on the things that make your business money versus the things that cost your business money, then your business will grow and you'll be more successful. As the CEO of GDW, as the CEO of five other subsidiaries of GDW, I focus on what grows our business. I focus on what makes our business bigger and, in, and, and, and grows it. I don't focus on going in the warehouse and packaging goods all the time. Now, do I go and check on my partners that I've, I've partnered with to handle parts of my business? Oh, yes. Do I check on my employees and make sure they're doing the job and, and make sure that if customers are, do I check on customer service all the time? Matter of fact, I spend a lot of time, probably more time than I should, in customer service because I want to know how you guys are feeling. I want to know 
that we're doing the job right. I want to know that you're happy. I want to know if you need us to do other stuff for you, right? I focus on the things that make the company money. I learned that a long time ago. Um, you know, I, as a as a as an artist, I would. For, I would create art. Uh, I'm a glass blower. My grandfather and grandmother were glass blowers. And in the 80s, uh, in the very, very early 80s, uh, I thought I was a starving artist. You know, I wanted to be that artsy, artsy guy. I, I'm very creative, and I love doing things with my hands. And uh, one of the things that I learned being an artist is you would create a series uh, 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 of art. And then you would go out and you would show it at a gallery, hopefully if you were any good. Uh, and the gallery would show your art and they would invite all their patrons, the big list of customers that they have that, that love to come look at new artists and new things they have at their gallery. And hopefully you're smart and you're in galleries that sell, uh, that cater to the type of people that buy your art. And you would sell pieces of art in the gallery and make some money. And then you would have to go back to the drawing board and create that art, create a new series of art and show it another gallery and show it another gallery and you kept doing that well if something happened to you what happened uh, is that it, you can't create that art you're, you're living from hand to mouth and the reason I know that is because in 1986 I was in a car wreck in a, on the highway in in Texas and uh, the motor of the car came through the dashboard and smashed both my knees. I broke my jaw. I put my hands through the dashboard. Uh, I woke up in the hospital, um, and it was a traumatic experience. I had to learn how to walk again. I, I went from doing this work with my hands that required all of me to not being able to work at all. And that lesson has been ingrained in me from that day that any business that you start, you need to focus on what grows that business and you need to partner with and or hire the people who can help you run, uh, operate that business and keep your eye on where, where it needs to be because it needs to be able to survive any one person not being there. So, and I, and I just use that story as an example because it was a very big lesson in my business life. If, if that wouldn't have happened, you know, I could still be living hand to mouth and not have understood or learned that lesson. It was a very hard way to learn that lesson. I would much rather have learned it by someone telling it to me or in school, but I had to learn it the hard way, right? So the best way to look at this is focus on the key pack parts of your business in e-commerce that are going to make you money. And what is that? Well, it's launching new products, finding and launching new products. It's your business. You know what niches you're going after. You want you know what you want to do. You're going to launch those products, so they're going to be yours. You want to you want to be in control of that piece. You want to be in control of of you know the initial listings and marketing and and uh, and and keyword research. All the parts that sell the product are super important because. Everything else you can outsource. All the grunt work. GDW prides itself as being the hands for you guys. Wear your hands, wear your feet. We do all the work. You guys just need to be smart enough to go out there and sell it. So, you know, it's best to outsource the grunt work. Anything like that is super important. So let's look at some examples other than that fairly graphic one about my car wreck in 86. Uh, recently, we sourced a glass bottle directly from China. We were selling glass bottles. I don't like plastic bottles. Uh, I like glass. We do camping. I'm part of the Boy Scouts with my son, and we go camping all the time. And you got a, a plastic bottle out there in the sun, in the heat, and after a while, the water tastes like plastic. I really don't like it. Uh, even, you know, it's the same thing. We so you say the same thing about aluminum cans. It made the flavor change. And uh, water out of a glass bottle is the best. So based on the market research we did, we saw that we could sell 10-plus bottles a day. So I went directly to China and bought a thousand units for a dollar fifty each up front. I shipped via ocean. It took forty-one days to get it. I actually have documented this process in my how I launched fifty products in, or how I am launching fifty products in sixty days blog series on the website gdwinc.com. 
and it took us 41 days to get in. This is one of the products I sourced. So I launched that product via promo. I gave away 150 units. It cost uh, at a sales price of two dollars each. So it cost me a dollar fifty. I sold them for two bucks. After all the fees and shipping costs, I lost money on each product that was given away. And the PP cost, the the pay per uh, pick pack and ship costs. I'm sorry, PPS stands for pick pack and ship. Amazon charged me a pick pack pack and ship shop shop blah, cost uh, more than two dollars. So our per unit we lost was roughly four dollars on every one of those we give away. So my total spend in ways and promos for the product and the promo was six hundred dollars. Right? Currently the product is on page one. We're selling over ten units a day. It has over forty reviews. It's four and a half stars. So there are some people who don't like it, but most people are enjoying it. We have forty five days of inventory in stock. I have another promo that we're going to bump it to get it up because we want to get it all the way up and I want to own that market share. And I'm going after additional keywords. We'll talk a lot more about keywords and any masterminds and things like that that you're with. That's a subject that can take a whole day by itself. So I'm going to go after additional keywords so that I want to rank it because I want to grab more traffic. And I expect to reorder again in two weeks to ensure that I do not go out of stock, OOS, out of stock, right? and lose position on Amazon. Why? I'm page one right now for my main keyword. I'm going to grab page one for secondary and tertiary keywords and I'm going to make sure I have enough stock to handle the sales volume bump that I expect to get. So I'm going to, and then I'll order every 30 days from now on. And all I'm going to have to manage is how many more units we sell a day. If I see that we increase our sales per unit, I'll manage that. If all of a sudden we're selling 12 a day, not 10 a day, my next order is to account for 12 a day in sales. If I sell 15 a day, I'll, I'll account for that. Uh, if I get invited to a lightning deal, I'll use air freight um, because you want to get product in fast and you have to be able to handle it. That's such a massive giveaway. It is insane how much that is. But you know that we're, we're getting into advanced topics, and again, that's probably another topic that we could go over in uh, in our mastermind groups. So, so I hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, we do uh, events, you know, we do some events, some mastermind events uh, every year. We do four of them right now. Uh, three of them are in China, and the reason is is because three times a year I have to go to China. Why do I need to go to China? To find more products to launch. If I'm launching a hundred products this year, uh, I need to go and source those products. Definitely not worth spending my time or paying employees to go and try to find that stuff on Alibaba. And if I'm looking at the law of averages in that 80-20 where we, we talked about earlier, I want to launch a minimum of 10 products. Why? Because if I launch 10 products, two of them are going to be winners, three of them are going to be duds, and five of them are going to chug along and probably pay me some of my money back uh, and, and do okay, right? And then I want to launch 10 more because then I'll get two more super killer winners. You know, I'll hit the gold vein and be able to mine for gold big time on those. Three or more of them will die and five more of them will chug along. Eventually what happens is the ones that are chugging along won't make sense for you anymore and your business will grow. And the reason I can tell you this is because when I started on Amazon, I launched 38 products in my first two weeks. 38 products in two weeks. All by hand, all manually. I was all in. I had eight thousand dollars in cash. I used it to source products, and I launched thirty-eight of them in two weeks. In ten months, we did eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <coughs> the next year, we did one point five million. So, as you can see, <coughs> it really does. The volume and the size of your business does correlate with how many products you have. The base. That's basics of mathematics. It's the law of averages. <clears throat> it's not throwing spaghetti on the wall. We use scientific methods. Excuse me, I need to take a drink. <clears throat> I got a frog. All right, so this isn't done by throwing spaghetti on the wall. We don't just go and grab a whole bunch of whatever and throw it on the wall. We use market research. We use tools. We use our brains. We use math. We use... Uh, a, a, a lot of different ways to look at these products and ensure that they are products that have a better chance of being successful. 
and I've actually uh, shown some examples on our Facebook group uh, in the mastermind and I've also been showing it in that blog I showed our launch a couple was it three weeks ago maybe four weeks ago now uh, when we launched the first series of products from our first source uh, this year in China our first source in February and uh, and we launched those and they launched and ran long enough that I could give a report as to where they were what position the volume of sales that we've done I've shown the sales volume on the on those products alone and where they're at and you know we're, we're able to really move the numbers quick um, I, we've had one product out of 57 that I'm gonna shoot in the head and uh, as Mr. Wonderful on the uh, Shark Tank says, that product is dead to me. So, uh, but out of 57 so far, only one of them's a dud. The other ones are moving along well. Some of them are exceedingly well. I mean, the ones I didn't expect, I thought they were going to be okay, are actually really doing extremely well. But there's a method to this, and it's a method as part of the quick launch process that we teach in our masterminds. And uh, I do China three times a year to source for myself. And I started inviting other people in my mastermind to come. And we've expanded it out to other people. So we expand it so that people like you, new or early stage or intermediate or even more advanced sellers can come and learn my sourcing techniques. But at the same time, we can spend time every single day we're there, every evening, hours and hours and hours of time together, masterminding and going over all of this in detail, going over the details on how you source the products, going over the details on how we figure out if it's a winner or a loser, or exactly how much do we need to order so we don't end up like Johnny Ecom, so we end up more like Billy Ecom. These are important things, and we talk about things like logistics and shipping and how the ordering process and how much cash it's really going to take to do this, things like that. And we also help you look at launching 10 products so that way you're going to get some successes quickly and you can start moving your business along instead of trying to chug along with one product and finally starting to see, you know, all of a sudden I'm doing $10,000 a month. It's only been a year. 10000 a month in a year? No way. How about $30,000 in the first month or $40,000 in the first month and then all of a sudden $50,000, $100,000 and within four, five, six months $150,000. That's what we're talking about doing. So we, these are the things we're going to go over. One of the cool parts is, is that I go over it step by step in a lot of detail and I do it with you. And the cool part is you get to watch me source. So I'm going to go source products that I'm going to sell and you get to be there and watch me do it. And I'm going to teach you how I do it while I'm there. So you're going to get that benefit at, at this event. Then you're going to get masterminds every single evening. Uh, and we have some really cool stuff I'll tell you about in a minute. But you get masterminds with us every single evening. So you can go visit the China Super Sourcing Com. This is not for everyone, but those of you who are serious about building an online e-commerce business, I think you're going to find huge value in it. There are testimonials from people that were, there, were at my last one that are on there. They're going to tell you about what we've done, the improvements in their existing business that they happen just from some of the stuff that they learned at the Mastermind, as well as what they were able to do while they were there. The China Super Sourcing events uh, include a travel concierge to help you arrange all your travel, your visas, everything else. All the hotel accommodations are included at a four-star hotel. Very nice rooms. Very nice. All the amenities that we're used to, so you don't have to worry you're not getting some kind of a Shanghai flea bag uh, motel or something. Uh, it does include a 4G China SIM card because internet in the hotels uh, is spotty. Internet in China is spotty in many ways, but their 4G LTE is really good and it works in the market. There is no internet in the market. It's really spotty there. Some of the stores have it. Other stores don't have it. Uh, we go to Yiwu, China, to one of the largest and oldest markets in China. It has a very great selection of common, durable, regular goods and because and, and at a lot of different price ranges. So we've been able to source products there for $0.17 cents a unit, and I've also sourced products there at $1,800 a unit. So it ranges your budget. So if you have a small budget, you can do it. If you have a bigger budget, you can do it. Your budget is your budget, and uh, this is a great place to go. But there's 70,000 shops under roof in this one location. It's year-round. Uh, Canton is twice a year, 
and different sections only last for a week or two. So you really don't have a lot of time. It isn't the manufacturer. You can't really do anything there. Here, it's year-round. You can go any time. Now, I go based on buying seasons, right? Spring, summer, winter, fall, and holiday. Those are the three base, main seasons. Uh, my buying is based on those seasons. So that's why I go at the time I go. It's a plan, right? This is how people buy. Let's, let's, let's cater to that. And we go early enough to ensure that we get the products that can be shipped by ocean, that can be prepped and done, and they can be in Amazon selling in time for that season. So we are going to go at the end of July this year. And the reason we're going in July is because if we go in July, we source our products, we ship it all ocean, we save a lot of money there, and then we get it, we prep it, we package it, we get it into Amazon. It should be in Amazon at the end of September or very early October. And October is the beginning of Q4, and Q4 is the biggest sales season of the year everywhere, right? Q4, all right? After Thanksgiving, all the Thanksgiving Day sales happen. Before that, though, now in October, the sales start coming. The sales really start in October, and it runs all the way through January. And that's that's that that whole Q4 sales is in that period of time. We want to make sure any products we have are ready, available in Amazon, launched and ready to go for Q4. That's setting yourself up for a really big hit in sales, a really big bump, a lot of revenue, a lot of volume in sales, and moves your your you up quite a bit. So it's important. And it's also I need to get ready to set up for Q4 myself, right? <clears throat> Anyway, the 4G China SIM cards are going to be provided, so that way we'll give everybody a China SIM. You'll be on the 4G there, and you'll have two gigabytes of data to be able to uh, surf the net and check on, you know, some of the things we're going to teach you, check on Amazon, check that kind of stuff uh, while you're there and you're in the market. We'll provide you with a shopping guidebook that kind of details and outlines what the market looks like and what it's about. Nothing special, but it kind of helps you carry it in your pocket, and it helps you get around. Hey, you know what? I want to find socks. Where are socks? Well, you can look there and say, oh, textiles are over here. That's where we got to go. Uh, we do something different than most of the other people. Whoops, let me do the back up again. We do something different. Each person, not groups of people, but each person gets their own personal translator and negotiator. This person will translate for you to the shop owners because most of the shop owners don't speak English or it is very little. Uh, so you want someone that can help translate, speak the common language, and negotiate on your behalf so that when you ask questions, they can translate that for you and help negotiate on pricing based on volume and ensure your MOQs are right. Translators are invaluable, and I want you to be able to go out and do this on your own. I don't want you to, you know, I'll put it this way. I'm going to take you to see my products as I go sourcing the very first day. And we're going to go source some products, and we're going to look at products, and we're going to talk about why I would source it and what I'm looking at and what I'm doing. right? But you probably don't want to have 10 people with you as you go look at the new widget you want to launch because, hey, you don't want nine other people buying the exact same thing you're buying and launching it as well. You know what? We are going to, we are going to do it. The law of average, I mean, it's just natural that people are going to, source similar products. We all think it's the same, right? I want some kitchen goods. What am I going to get? I'm going to source something in the kitchen, right? Knives. I want to source knives. Okay, great. You know what? There's a ton of stainless steel and knives in, in, uh, in Yibu. It's a great place to get that kind of stuff, right? <clears throat> so you're going to buy it. Well, what I, what I want to do is say, it's okay if you buy knives and I buy knives. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't want you seeing exactly what I'm buying and how I'm customizing it. And copying me. If you buy a, a red-handled knife and I buy a green-handled knife, that's okay. Guess what? We both had a great idea. No big deal. We're competing on equal grounds. But if you're just copying me, I don't like that. And so I wouldn't want to go on a trip where they weren't going to give each individual their own translator. So because it's something I wouldn't want, I'm doing that for you as well. You each get your own personal translator. So after day one, after you go around with me, after that day, You'll have your own translator. They'll go with you. You'll meet with them every single morning. You'll go and source stuff in the market. They're going to be your personal guide to help you through the entire market to make things happen. We're going to have daily masterminds every single day. Basically, after the market shuts down about 5 o'clock, they start closing it down. And when it shuts down, it shuts down. So basically, you can't keep going even if you wanted to, really. 
Um, so at five o'clock, we all meet back at the hotel, go upstairs, and we have dinner together, all of us. And at that dinner, we're going to have a podium, a stage, we're on projectors, we'll have our laptops hooked up, and we'll be able to go through the the multi-step process that I call the quick launch process that goes over every single piece of how we source, how we determine if the product is good, how we know how much to order, how we calculate pricing, how shipping is going to work, how much is that going to cost, how is all the how are all these pieces of this big giant puzzle I just showed you guys work and what is the end result and that way you can start to understand it and you'll be able to take that information and that value on your own uh, to do that. So we're going to do that every single day. This is a working trip, guys. It isn't a vacation. We're there to source. We're there to set up for Q4. We're there to learn how to make money. We're not there to go to Canton and go out to dinner at fancy restaurants and go travel and look at the Terracotta Warriors. Hey, trust me, I'm going to do that. I love to do that. But let's do that after we work, right? Not before. So we're going to have masterminds. I'm also going to open up something called uh, uh, office hours. I'm going to set up office hours in my office. I have an office there in the hotel. Uh, you will be able to come up and schedule one-on-one -on -one time with me uh, to be able to help you out and answer questions privately. So you can show me, hey, you know what? You're talking, you, you taught me on day one how to source, and you taught me how to do this thing, and you taught me how to determine, and here's the numbers I got, but before I go spend any money, before I place these orders, can you just validate that this is right? You know, that's just an example of why I'm doing office hours because in the last trip, the people who went thought that that would be a great idea and they thought that office hours would really make an improvement. Well, I listen to what my customers and my friends and my cut and my and my partners in business want, and so we added the math, the uh, office hours to the event. So I'm going to be working with you guys a lot. Also, I brought members of our mastermind in something called the Million Dollar Club. Uh, the people who, of the, I think I mentioned it earlier, but of the 20 people who went to our private invite-only uh, business coaching event December of last year, uh, half of them are in the Million Dollar Club now. They weren't then, but they are now. And they follow the processes, and they've developed processes of their own. A lot of them have grown really well. They're extremely smart, bright, hardworking people, and they've done uh, it really well. Well, we have several of them coming on the trip, and they're going to come. And I'm going to have them talk to you, so it's not just me. It's them as well. They're going to tell you what they do. They're going to tell you how they launch. They're going to tell you some of the lessons that they've learned that may even be different than what I've learned, all to help educate you, help be with you. So that way, it's not me trying to help 30 people by myself or me trying to spread out my time between all of you, but having multiple million or multi-million dollar e-commerce sellers today helping you learn so you're going to get that at that that's why these are masterminds this is we're going on a sourcing trip but really you're coming to a mastermind event and I'm going to teach you to source while we're at it all your meals are included breakfast lunches in the market and dinner because we're going to be working at our table at dinner time in a, in a big conference room that we're setting up and bringing all the food in so we don't have to worry about that so all meals are included we do have a couple of special events planned to get us outside of that because all work and no play makes Alan a dull boy. And so we're going to go, we're going to work, 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 and we're going to work really hard. But one evening we'll go out and we'll go and have dinner out of, uh, out of the hotel and out of the conference room. And we'll be able to just build relationships. And, you know, the friendships and relationships that are built on these events last forever. These are, these are people that become your mastermind group, your mentor group, people that you can work with and ask questions to that will help you along the way. And you can help them as well. So we'll all hang out together and we'll do a little bit of that. All the group transportation and all the group activities are included. So any transportation we need to go outside of the, uh, of the conference center, outside of the hotel, will be included in that event. Now, this is not a big PowerPoint, death by PowerPoint presentation. This is a mastermind. We're going to go and do it live. We're going to pull up Amazon live. We're going to use the tools live. We're going to talk about products that you saw me source. So when I go and source the products, we're going to go back and we're going to talk about those products and we're going to see if they're valuable, determine if they're good, and we're going to show you how to do that. So this is a live training. We're going to go over this stuff all the way through from point A to point B. And I think the benefit is 
is that GDW will help you all the way from the very beginning till the product is in Amazon and help you learn how to launch and sell it. So what we can do is we can help you from point A to point B all the way to sales from the very beginning all the way through to you starting to make money. We can help you, we can guide you, and we can mentor you, but you have to take action. See, that's the one thing we can't do. We can't take action for you. You have to take action. You have to make that decision that says, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to take action, and I'm willing to put one foot in front of the other and do this so that I can build something that's way better than anything I have today. I hire, you know, when I hire employees, I'll give you this as a fun story. I think you'll get it, right? When I hire employees, I learned a valuable lesson. I used to try to hire people that were super skilled, right? I'm in technology, and I'm hiring skilled engineers, and they better have a pedigree, and they better come with a great resume, and they better be the best of the best of the best, right? What I learned was you can hire the best, but if they have a crappy attitude and they don't take action, they're basically a body in a chair that sucks up all your money, right? They just sit there and cost you money, and they bring no value to themselves or to the company they work for. See, we have to determine what's our attitude. Is our attitude the glass half empty or the glass is half full? Is our attitude that we're ready to take action right now, and we're going to take those steps to move our businesses forward, and we're going to make it happen? Are we going to find a mentor that's going to help bring us all the way through? Can we find a mentor that can do it? Right now, I'm going to open this up for the Q&A, but our China Super Sourcing event is huge, man. And, and you know what? You know, you can ask me anything, anything you want. I'll give it to you. And you can, you can go on our Facebook group and ask people who've been to the event and ask them what they think. You know, I think they're all going to tell you the same things. You can see the testimonials of the videos from the people who were, were with us on this page, China Super Sourcing. I think you'll get it. So I don't need to talk about that anymore. But I do want to answer your questions because I'm hopefully you guys have a lot, or maybe I answered them all. I don't know. Jeff, if you want to open that up, and then uh, you know we'll talk about it. Well, actually, before that, you know, because I know we're going to spend a lot of time. A lot of time the Q and A runs long. So real quick, let me just go this. I have ten more spots left for this event. That's it. There are no more. Uh, apparently, Jeff updated this for me and says that we. We had the early bird registration, and the people who jumped in the early bird got an extra day with me. They get to come a day early, and they get that day with me. I'm going to spend time with them. We're going to have a meal together. We're going to fellowship. We're going to mastermind, and then I'm going to get them a day ahead of everybody else and get them moving. So they, they come early, and they got it, and that was a thank you for believing in me and registering early, being an early bird, because we launched the promo on this fairly early. Uh, because I like to be on time, not late. <laughs> and so I, I insisted on it. So we don't have very many spots left. I mean, we're going to sell this out and close it out a month before we even go, or maybe even less than that. Uh, it could be a month and a half, two months before we even go on, on the trip. And I wanted to do that because it's cheaper to buy plane tickets two months out. If we waited to the last minute, uh, I hate it whenever people do that. It drives me crazy. And I don't like to throw money away for nothing. So I did this to make sure you guys got the best value and your plane tickets were cheap and we could get hotel rooms and all those things could happen. So now that we're about to close it out early, it's like, what am I going to do? You know, the last, the last people, what are they going to get? Let's give them some value too. So I decided, I talked to Jeff and I said, hey man, you know what? The, the, the people who close this out, let's give them something too. Man, they believe in it. They have faith. They're the ones who are going to do it. Let's close this thing out with a bang. So there's a post-trip mastermind. So you're going to come and you're going to start on the normal day, but you can stay a day later. And there's some benefit to that. See, I'm not going to do all my main sourcing on day one. Yes, I'm going to source products and we're going to go over them and we're going to review them and we're going to see how they're good, they're bad, they're indifferent or whatever. I may just give those products away to people who come to this trip after we've done all the work. But I need to launch 33 more products this year to hit my 100 products. So I am dead set on sourcing 33 products. Now, you know, I could get lucky and do it in a day, but more than likely it's going to take me a couple of days if I'm not trying to run around and be like a madman. Uh, we can do it pretty quick. We may get lucky and, and knock it out of the park and find something that will really kill it and make it happen. But 
I plan on taking the very last day after everyone's gone and me and the team and the people in the Million Dollar Club that are coming to help, that's our sourcing time. That's when we're going to hit it and we're going to source hard. And so you'll get to come with us when we hit it the road hard and we start sourcing. After everyone else leaves, you're going to get to hang with us while we do that. And, you know, I'll have some additional office hours to do a little private sessions. You know, you're going to get all that. You're going to get all the meals. You're going to get the masterminds. You're going to get everything else. But you're also going to get to stay an extra day and you get to hang out and get some mastermind. And that's only for like 10 people. So only 10 people are going to get to do that. That means it's going to be like, you know, if I have, well, well, well we're going to have, what, five team, team members there? So, you know, you're going to be able to get, uh, you know, two to one, three to one time with someone who's killing it online, who's going to help you out. You're going to have to watch those people do their job and you're going to get to see it really start to happen. So I wanted to give that as a thank you to the people who closed this thing out. So anyway, that's basically it on that one. Now let's go ahead and open it up for Q&A here, Jeff, and uh, let's see if we can help some people out. Yeah, we got Larry who's uh, coming on the next trip, actually. Hi, Larry. Uh, how much product research do you do before going to China compared with product research after, after you've arrived there? That's funny. Hey, Larry, didn't you ask me that on the Facebook group? <laughs> I've been asked that a lot of times, and I'll be honest, I do zero product research before I leave. Uh, I've done that before. Spend all that time, do all this product research, and then I get there, and this place is huge. There's a million different products. There's 70,000 different vendors, and I'm going to go try to fly the blue widget that's exactly one quarter of one inch, and it has to be this perfect one because that's the one I did my product research on, and I can't find it because the place is too big. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. I have learned that act in actuality, the only product research I'm going to do ahead of time is what categories I want to launch products in. So if I'm looking to expand my pet product lines, I'm going to go and say, okay, guess what? I'm going to go, and when I go there, I have a specific goal to go in the section of the market that has pet supply products, and I'm going to go start looking at products there. I'm going to find out what their newest, latest hot sellers are. I'm going to ask those questions to these people. I'm going to look and see what catches my eye. Maybe I've been looking on Amazon in that market, in that area, Maybe I've looked at the categories and I'm like, hey, you know what? Looks like this dog bone's pretty hot in that area. And if I happen to see it, then maybe I'll look a little bit deeper in it. But I'm still not going to buy it right off that bat. And I, and I just find it a waste of time to try to find something exactly specific. Now, as you get some experience in the market, as you learn what's, what's there and what can be done and what can't be done, then you can probably start to do that, but I still don't. It just, it, it, it doesn't, it's not an efficient use of time. I can source 15, 20 products in an hour uh, without having to do that. And out of those 15, 20 products that I've looked at that are potential products, I can determine an easy five, six winners. So if I can do 15 to two products an hour that are potential, find five of them that I'm going to buy, all it takes me is a day to source 50 products. And I'm going to show you how to do that, exactly how I do that. So anyway, I would search categories. I'd look at the areas. You know, if you want to get in some niches, let's say, you know, you want to get into kitchenware or kitchen goods or whatever, then that's it. I also know that if you don't have a large Amazon business today, if you're just starting out and you have a limited budget, you probably don't, you probably want to look at products that fit in your budget not products that you think you want to sell. And I will, <laughs> it's funny, every time I, I'm, you know, I was called the Gadget Man, uh, my store is called, what's called Gadget Deals Wholesale, GW, GDW stands for Gadget Deals Wholesale. And uh, that was the name of my, my uh, liquidation company, that was the name of my, my store that I had here in Houston before uh, 08, 09 put us under. And, um, I remember, you know, looking for the next latest, greatest thing. Always, you know, I love electronics. I love gadgets. I really like 
uh, that kind of stuff. It's cool. You know, I have no problems picking up the newest cell phone and getting to understand the apps and using it. My wife still has problems with her iPhone 5. Uh, she still doesn't know how to use it very well. Right? But I have no problems with that stuff. I really like doing it. And so I still like being a consumer of those products, but I really hate selling them because you're constantly chasing and trying to find that product. Uh, and they tend to be more expensive, so you're chasing things that are harder to sell uh, and have a shorter lifespan. Uh, personally today, and I've said this on many webinars, I've said it in many, many, many things, I look for durable, consumable goods that people buy every day. I want stuff that people are going to buy for me today, tomorrow, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. I like stuff that is boring, simple and people buy and have bought for decades. I would rather sell toilet paper than the latest iPhone. Because the latest iPhone will only last for about six months before the next one comes out, and that one isn't worth anything anymore. But people will buy toilet paper for the rest of their lives. So we'll find products that fit your budget. We'll look at that, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about. And uh, you know that's a great question too, man. And and, I, and I, Jeff, remind me to add that to this because we need to. That's that's an important piece. When we talk about managing your cash, you you need to manage what you buy too, based on what your budget will allow. If you have five thousand dollars to spend on products, let's budget your entire purchasing based on that five thousand dollar budget and the true costs across the whole life cycle of that product. So that way you can be successful instead of blowing it all. On a product and not having the money on the backside to be able to fund it, right? So you you know that that's the kind of stuff we're going to work on when we're there, and those are the things we're going to talk about a lot, and we're going to show examples of and go over so that you understand the math and you understand how that works. So great question, Larry, man, I appreciate it. Hopefully this time I answered it a lot better than I did whenever you pinged it on the Facebook group. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. So Sarah, now Sarah asked this a while back and I'm just trying to recall if when you went through this piece, if you, if you went through this or not, she was asking, oh, are you going to show the, uh, the formula for managing inventory when using ocean freight? Real simple, fast answer. 30 days in inventory, 30 days on the ocean and 30 days ordered. If you have that and you constantly follow that methodology, you won't run out of stock. Then all you have to manage is spikes in sales or declines in sales. So you have 30 days in inventory so you can cover yourself for a month. It takes a month to ship. Actually, 45 days is usually good, but you can get, a, you can get away with 30 a lot of the times. It's only those times when traffic gets busy or they hit a storm that will mess you up. And air freight can save your butt in those cases if you have to. Uh, but 30 days in inventory. 30 days on the ocean, 30 days being manufactured at the manufacturer. And we'll go over how that looks in more details in our measure. Cool. Um, Graham is uh, giving us kudos on the webinar. Thank you, Graham. And thank you, Graham, for showing up for multiple webinars because he's referenced something in our uh, last webinar. But he's asking about. Amazon allowing people to have multiple accounts as long as each account is under a different business entity. All day, uh, every day. Since the possibility of your account suspended, of course, a common fear. I was wondering if opening a second account under a different LLC, for example, would provide protection against being unable to sell on Amazon in the event that my primary account were to get suspended. Or do you think That's Amazon would ban both accounts? That's a good question, and uh, from experience, and you'll probably, if you guys have followed me at all, you'll know that I had my very first Amazon account suspended, and it took me four years to get back. And the way that happened was I went to ASD in Las Vegas. Or, uh, no, I went to Channel Advisor. I went to the Channel Advisor show in Las Vegas, and I'm and Amazon had a presence there, and there was a VP, and I just went and asked him a question. I said, you know, here's what happened. It was a business, but it was under my personal name, and this is what happened. And she pulled me to the side and said, here's what you do. You open a business. It's a new business. It has its own checking account, its own EIN. It's a separate company. And you open up an Amazon account, and you should have no problems. I did that 
and I opened two, I went back after that event I opened two Amazon stores at that time and then since then I have now four Amazon stores yes you can do that yes you can make it happen uh, I don't worry about my all my Amazon stores being shut down because I make a mistake in one I have made mistakes and got the naughty gram from Amazon in one account and they didn't reference any of the other ones so I don't think that, that is a problem. Now, if you're screwing up in all of the accounts, yeah, definitely a problem. Uh, but it's a, it's something that's not hard to manage, and you can do it. And with you know, but does it make sense for you to have multiple accounts? You know, if you're not doing anything wrong, you're probably not going to have a problem. The only reason to think about that, you know, for me it was I want different niches. I don't want to sell food along with other other items that aren't related on the same account. For me it was breaking out different niches into different sales funnels. You know, I, I wasn't thinking of using it as a way to be able to uh, mess around and, and, and do the wrong things against Amazon's terms of service on one account and then if they hose it I get to go to another one. So that's not even, I don't even think of that. You know, do, give Caesar what is here, Caesar's, it's Amazon's playground, they own the ball, and they can take the ball and go home anytime they want. So follow Amazon's rules. And if Amazon changes the rules, learn how to deal with it and adjust your yourself accordingly, and you won't have any problems. But yes, you can have multiple accounts, and it's as simple as opening up a new business, registering it, getting an EIN in the United States. I don't know if they need the same requirements in in uh, Europe or or uh, or South America or or, or Australia. Uh, the rules are a little bit different because you, some of those things you don't need. Um, so you'll have to check the rules in those places. But in the U.S., just a separate EIN, a separate bank account, and that's all you need. Good questions, guys. Good questions. Keep them coming. Jeff, man, you're a little slow, buddy. You sound sick. Oh, wait a minute. You just told me you were. <laughs> uh, oh, man, I can't man. get back on. Uh, okay, so let's see. Liz, who's coming on the next trip, just giving us kudos. Thanks so much for your passion and the value that you share, Alan. Looking forward to you. Excited to put a higher value on my time than what I'm doing now. I'm glad, man. There's nothing more important than your time. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. You know, cool. what, I, what I really like, what's cool, I mean, just, just on that point, what's really cool, guys, is seeing some some of the people that have come to our group, some, some of the mastermind people. And if you're members of other groups, you may know who Dr. Ben is. Dr. Ben, I've known him since he started. I've worked with him, mentored him since he started. He's part of my mastermind group. He's part of my Million Dollar Club. And him and his partner, Peter, are, are set to probably break the $3 million run rate this year. That's, that's, they're really on track, three to four million dollars this year. They are moving so much faster than I have because they have been able to take the value of the knowledge and, and, and what I've done before them, and they've ran with it. They've taken action on what they've learned. You can go and learn as much as you want, but if you don't take action, it's worthless. Knowledge without action is worthless, but knowledge with action is priceless. Take action. I'll give you the knowledge. I'll show you how to do it. You just need to take action. For some of you, this China Soup Trip is that action, and it will change your life. Great one, and I really look forward to meeting you guys, too. I love doing this stuff. I, I really do, and my mission statement is seriously to change a 1,000 businesses' lives and see that happen, and we are well on our way. It's exciting. Awesome. Uh, Kelly, can we hire GDW to get a product from China to us via C? Uh, well, I mean, I have containers almost every single week coming in from China. We have a warehouse in China, so that's a, kind of one of the advantages. Nobody else has this. No, nobody else in this space, no, none of the trainers, none of the other gurus, none of the other prep centers actually have an office in China where we can accept the goods bundle them into our containers at the lowest rate possible, ship them into the United States, and then do the prep work and get it into Amazon for you. So we can definitely help you with that, but I will say that up until this point, I really don't do it where we're going to bring it into the U.S. In, 
I have a few people that came on the China trip that have taken advantage of all of that but and are not having it prepped by us, but that was because they had a prep center that they built. This was Dave Shannon who came on the last one. Dave, if you're on, man, I love you, buddy, and I, I wish you all the success. Keep growing, and I hope you come on more events with us. Dave's, Dave's a Missouri boy, He's, and I'm a, I, I lived in Missouri for a long time, so I'm, I'm, uh, my heart's in the Midwest for sure. And, uh, and so he came on, and he was already doing $250,000 a month when he came with us, right? The value of what we're doing is even for big sellers uh, because he wants to get to $5 million, right, or, or a million. You know, my goal is to be a million a month next year. So, um, you know, we were hoping to do it this year, but it looks like it may be next year with all this work that we're doing because the GDW side is exploding. But, uh, but the, uh, but basically, he already had that. So for him, it didn't make sense. So he's going through all the shipping, and then we'll just freight it over from here to, to him, and he'll save a bunch of money that way. So, you know, if you already have that, it makes sense. We'll definitely work with you on it. But for the most part, if you're just looking for shipping services to do that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, we have a freight forwarding work order that you can fill out on our worksheet, um, and and we can we can you know accept it in China, load it in the container, ship it at reduced rates. When it gets to the U.S., we can ship it from Houston to wherever you are, and hopefully we can save you some money and uh, and help you out. And you know maybe you'll think about it and it makes sense, and you'll want us to do a quick inspection and ship it into Amazon for you. We're four hours away from the Dallas Amazon Center. Most of the shipments we ship out go straight to Dallas. And so it's one day, it's at Amazon. Within two to three days, it's, it's loaded up, and it started to selling uh, really quick. So it works very well here. And because we're centrally located in the United States, it basically only takes a day or two to get to any of the Amazon fulfillment centers. So it doesn't matter if we're shipping East Coast or West Coast. We take about the same amount of time to all of those locations. And with the new uh, Amazon fulfillment centers being built in San Marcos, that's only uh, about uh, two, two and a half hours away, we're going to see an even faster turn time for products getting into FBA from our fulfillment center than even the California-based fulfillment centers. Because they have to ship to New York, and it takes longer for them to ship there than it does for us. But yeah, just fill out the work order on the website. If you go to uh, GDW dot com you'll see FBA prep click on that you'll see create a new work order uh, and then you'll see one that says freight forwarding worksheet fill out the freight forwarding worksheet tell us what you want we'll look at it and uh, we'll work with you to get a price and get it in on one of our containers thanks for asking awesome so uh, Wayne who's also going on the next trip might be a dumb question but what kind of device do I need to bring to Yiwu so that the I don't think he typed this right um, the lit works with the SIM card. I think he meant to type something else there. But basically, he's asking what does he need for the SIM card to work. Um, and I guess you know, he, yeah, he needs an well, you need an unlocked global phone, right? Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And I have AT and T, and all I have to do is go over to the AT and T store and pay them. They'll unlock it, so I can use the China symbol on there. So if oh, you're you with a big it. service and you've got a phone like that, you can do it. And then there are, there's a whole bunch of, of unlock services. Uh, there's even unlock services in China. Cool. Uh, but mostly the SIM card is for data. You know, generally we don't make a whole lot of phone calls home that way. You know, I don't know about you, but I use like uh, Google Hangouts and I talk to the family that way. Uh, or Facebook messaging, or, or FaceTime if you got an iPhone. You know, I like to talk to my family that way while I'm out of time. So for me, I just use that. Uh, I don't call. I don't make a lot of calls. We'll use um, we'll use um, WhatsApp. Uh, we'll use WhatsApp. So everybody who comes, we'll all get on WhatsApp. We'll create a WhatsApp group, and that way we you can ping me, we can ping each other, and stuff like that while we're there. So that if you're out in the market and you're looking at something and you just want to ask ask a quick question. You can just kind of ping it, and then I can respond that way. Or if you're, you know, asleep in your hotel room in the morning and we're at breakfast, kind of masterminding, and you get a big breakfast, I can ping you and say, "Hey, come on down." So, so anyway, hopefully that helps. But yeah, it should, it should be all you need. All right. Um, Harley's asking, and I think this is in reference to the question that Larry asked you. 
Um, you don't recommend product research? Uh, I wouldn't go try to rec research a whole bunch of products and then take this big list with me to the market and then go try to find all those products. You will spend more time trying to find those products than you would if you just research categories you want to sell in and then go look for the areas in the market that have products in those categories already and then start looking at those products. It's more efficient. You're going to do the product research. Get me. I'm saying before the trip, don't. there's no use to do product research to go to try to find specific products you've researched before you got there. When we go there and you look at products in those categories, before you purchase them, I'm going to teach you how to do the product research, and you will do it. Generally, it works real simply. You go there, you look at the categories, you look at products, you get some product ideas, but you don't buy anything. I'll show you how you do that, how I do it is really efficient. Then you come back and that night you do product research for the products you've looked at. Like I said, I can source 15 potential products in an hour, but only say five of them will pass the muster to be able to be considered as a product I'm going to actually spend the money on because I'm going to do the product research in China on the products that I found in China. I'm not going to do product research before I go and then go to try to find those products while I'm there. No, I don't do that. And I'm launching 100 products this year. All righty. Hopefully, hopefully that clarified it because I can see how that could get confusing. Yeah. I'm not really sure how to spell this person, uh, pronounce this person's name. Sorry about that. Um, and I don't want to destroy it so uh, how much capital need do you need for sourcing 10 products in China and how much for launching all 10 based on your process well uh, you know that's a great question definitely one I get it uh, every webinar we get that question we get that question on a regular basis people ask me how much money do I need how much money do I need I like I said I launched this with eight thousand dollars and I launched 38 products in two weeks okay so you know your budget and how much money you have is 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 yours everybody's different you know my budget may be fifty or a hundred thousand dollars on this sourcing trip and I do that three times a year so my budget's different than yours right what we what we want to learn is how to work within our budget and buy products that fit the budget we have right now and can be successful with those products so that we can increase our capital so that the next time we source we can upscale the product to something maybe a little more expensive and then we can turn our capital and go and source again and find something a little more expensive and start sourcing those higher end products when our capital allows us to so you know I I you know if you wanted to if it was me I'd say 10 grand you know if I have 10 grand I feel comfortable I can do it I can do it on five I can probably do it on three because of what I know now and because of the processes that we have I could probably do it if I have three thousand dollars to spend on product I could easily launch 10 plus products. Uh, one of the people that went to our last China super sourcing trip, we got nine products. They were 17 and a half cents a piece. He bought 2,400 units of each. Okay, we want to do the math on that. Those products are going to sell for about $12 a pop. Amazon's going to take six. He's going to have $2 in them. He's going to profit $4 a unit. $4 profit on a 17 cent spend. If we look at the ROI on that, it's huge because his budget wouldn't allow him to do more. But he's going to eat. It, it's a good product. It's in a great category. It's in a good market. We did our research. I have no fear that those products are going to make him money and he's going to increase his capital so the next time he sources products, he's going to be able to move up. So you can source products for 50, 60 cents, 25 cents, if that's what your budget will allow you to do. 
but still you have to take into account, even on the lower dollar figure products, that law of averages and the 80-20 rule. That never fails. Mathematics doesn't fail. Mathematics doesn't lie. Mathematics is always true. Even fuzzy logic. So, you know, your budget is your budget. You know, if you've got five grand, you're in a pretty damn good position to, to make some things happen. If you've got ten grand, you're even in a better position. If you've got fifty grand, man, you are, you are solid. You know, you could launch twenty products, fifty, you know, easily. No problem. No problem at all. I got, uh, on the last day of the trip, when everybody was packing up to leave, I went and sourced 22 products. And that's what I did, and I spent, how much did I spend? Uh, I have to look it up. Well, uh, I spent $19,000 on those 22 products, but I bought products that were, uh, are selling in the $100 plus range on Amazon. But I also bought products for a dollar and a half a piece that are going to sell for $25 on Amazon. So my, my mix of price ranges is different uh, for me because I have more, bought more capital to do that, right? My, my business is bigger and it's been around a little longer. Um, so I'm able to kind of spread it. But I still go for some of the lower dollar stuff too because I, it never fails to surprise me that I can bundle Three fifty or four fifty cent products for a total of two dollars, and sell it for twenty five bucks all day long. And in Q four, <laughs> it's completely nuts. It's completely nuts. So you know, it's definitely the right time. Your budget is yours. Don't stress that too much. If you've got enough money to make it happen. Definitely, I can help you figure out where your product budget needs to be to get you to where you want to go. So hopefully, hopefully I covered that well, and it kind of gives you that that idea. Because I do get that question a lot, and I try to answer it the same way a lot. You know, early on it was hey, ten grand, ten grand, ten grand. You know, if it was me, that's what I would spend. If I I would spend ten grand, but my budget's different than yours, and so I don't want to put that limiter on you and hold you back from doing something that I know is great by saying that's what you have to have, because in reality, it's not. Cool. Um, Ted, did you say we need an EIN to do business in China? We are new no. to e-commerce. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. The EIN conversation had to deal with um, opening up an Amazon store in the United States. If you want to have more than one Amazon store, I always open up a pro account, uh, and it's a business account, and it's in the name of the business using the business's EIM. I don't want to put it under my personal name, one, because personally I was banned from Amazon, and I still personally cannot have a personal account on Amazon. But I have four business accounts on Amazon, four separate Amazon business accounts. And that's because they're all four separate businesses and they sell four separate different types of product. And you can't, you can't, yeah, and just to clarify that, because I, I forgot to mention this, and this will hopefully help the other person who asked that question, you can't open four Amazon accounts and sell exactly the same thing in all four of them. That is against Amazon Terms of Service, and it is not what I do or what I'm promoting. So just want to make sure that I clarify. Cool. Um, all right, Greg, can you explain a little more on duty taxes, when and how do we have to pay express service or air freight and sea? Uh, great question, and, and, it's, and, and, and that makes perfect sense. So um, if you use GDW, if you come with us, one, if you come with us, you get discounts. You get the biggest discount of anybody that we currently service uh, if you come with us for the products that you buy on the sourcing trip. You're going to get a huge discount on the services side. Part of the services is the containers that we already have in China that we'll be loading and shipping from. Um, so since I already have the containers coming, 
uh, basically what we do is we split the cost uh, with you on the container. So I'll get the container into the United States. I pay for all that up front. Your product will be on the container. Then what we do is we calculate the amount of space you used in that container, and then we divide the cost uh, equally uh, among people on that. So you won't be paying for shipping or duty until after the product arrives in the United States because, one, we don't know what the duty is going to be on your product until it comes and U.S. Customs and Border Patrol takes it from my account. I have a continuous bond. We are a freight forwarder. So basically, you, the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, they calculate based on the commercial invoice and what the products are in their HS code, and they deduct the money through ACH right out of my account. Once they deduct that money out of my account, I know what the duty charges for your product are because it's the actual duty charges that they've taken. And at that point, we bill you both the freight and the duty charges for that shipment. So it'll, that'll happen afterwards. <clears throat> Same as any of the processing costs or anything like that. That all happens after you bought the product and after it's already arrived in the United States and after it's prepped and ready to go into Amazon for sale. Cool. Uh, Larry's back. Um, on the trip, do you go over your process of creating killer listings? Yes. We're going to... We go over everything from A to Z. And also, well, you know what? We're going to go, we go over that, but this is a sourcing trip and a launching trip, right? So we're going there primarily to source products and launch them and learn how to launch them and learn how to determine if they're good products. So I'm going to say a majority of the time that we're going to spend together masterminding is going to be on those subjects, right? Because it's important. You're learning, you're, you're trying to source the product and you're trying to launch the product. Those are the first two steps that you need to be able to make before you can even do this business, right? And so we're going to focus most of the time at the event in China on those subjects. But all the way up until you launch the product, we have a weekly uh, mastermind webinar. I do it every Tuesday at 8 o'clock for the people who go to China and for anybody who's in my mastermind group to reiterate what are we doing today, how have we made changes, what are, what are the effects, that kind of stuff. And in those webinars, we go step by step, one step at a time through the entire process. Now, I don't go over how do I open an Amazon account. The reason why, you can go on before we ever go to the trip, and you can go on YouTube, and there's a bazillion people who will, say, who, who will do a, a, a screen capture and show you I go to Amazon.com, I click on open a new account, and here's how I fill out the form, right? That You can find that anywhere. What you are not going to find is how do I source the product? How do I determine if it's good? How do I determine which launch strategy I'm going to use to launch this product? How do I, do, how do I create killer photography? How do I do uh, um, keyword research, which we will go over keyword research in China. That's important because it's an important part of determining the market strategy and the launch strategy. How do I do keyword research? We're going to go over it again. Uh, we're going to go over how do we do uh, the Amazon marketing service or the pay-per-click campaigns. How do we set up the promos? Brian Johnson, uh, who I mentioned earlier, is a good friend of mine. He comes in and I bring him in. He's the expert in this area. So I'm going to bring him in, and he comes in, and he shows you guys how to do it, how that works. And he opens himself up, and just like I'm doing this Q&A, he offers that Q&A. And then we go over launch services like uh, Viral Launch and, uh, and Snag Shout and Thomason. And uh, Jeff Cohen is part of our group. He's part of our mastermind group, and he's part of our Facebook group. Jeff Cohen works at, at uh, Seller Labs, so we'll go over how do you do feedback, how do you get reviews using Feedback Labs product, and how do you use Snagshot, which is another one of their products. And he'll come on, and we'll do a whole webinar on just that subject in extreme detail on here's exactly how you do it. So we're going to walk you through the entire process step by step by step in the order that you need to worry about it. Trying to learn everything up front and become an expert before you've ever taken an action step. We kind of talked about that, right? Knowledge without action is worthless. What I'm going to do is force you to take those steps 
in order one at a time. The first step is sourcing products. The second step is determining if those products are worth it or not, which happens to entail keyword research and market research. So we're going to go over those three subjects. Then we're going to go over how to place our orders and stuff like that so we can place our orders. And then we're going to talk about shipping because that's the next step in the process. And then we're going to talk about just what you mentioned this now, duty and freight charges and how does that happen because that's the next step after that. And then the next step after that is is packaging and hopefully well, we'll talk about packaging in China, but we're going to talk about prepping, the prepping the goods. What do we need to do? How does that look? What do we need to do? When do we need to do it? And we're going to do it when it needs to be done so that you can take action on that step at the appropriate time, not try to get all the knowledge and then not take any action on it. Because if you get the knowledge and then take action on it, and then you get the knowledge and take action on it, you'll remember it. And you'll be taking those action steps. And every time you take that action step, you move farther along the process. For those of you who like sports, maybe you like football, being it soccer in the U.S., what we call soccer, which is football everywhere else, or American football, you understand their strategy, right? And the goal is, and rugby, another good the goal is, is to move the ball and move the ball down the field and score. In American football, I call it pounding the rock, and that is moving the ball three yards at a time because you rarely get the big, giant Hail Mary touchdown pass. The, the, the odds of that happening are very few, but running three yards, running three yards, running three yards, passing those short three and four and five yards, those are more – uh, the odds of those being successful are greater, and you move the ball down the all the way down the thing. So at the end of this, my goal is for you to score a touchdown. We're going to pound the rock every day and every week until you launch those products and you're starting to get success. By then, you'll already know everything you need to know to run, and you'll have contacts, you'll have expertise, and you'll have action behind that and you'll be able to really take the ball and run hard on your own. That's the goal. So hopefully that helps you guys kind of get a picture of my philosophy on bringing this together because that's how I build the product. That's how I build my business. When I build the product, I don't try to figure everything out for that product up front. I try to find the product and source it and validate that it's good first. Then I look at the market to see what the market says. And then I look at my keywords to see what I need to go after to make it work and how much traffic and how much searches is happening and all that kind of stuff. And then I figure out how much it's going to cost me to ship it. And then I figure out how much my duty and taxes are going to be. And I just take it one step at a time. And if you just move it one step at a time, by the end of it, you're scoring touchdowns. So hopefully that analogy puts it together in a way that makes it a little more understandable. But it's a great question, Larry. Thank you. Then uh, Larry has one other question. Is your wife's name Kim? <laughs> what? Uh, the actress Kim Basinger, I'm guessing. he's. he's uh, no, she's my cousin. I got all the money. She got all the looks. Nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, man. Actually, uh, we, we, are re we, we really are related. <laughs> but I don't know her. Yeah. Um. Yeah, man. That's all the questions, man. It's all the wow, questions you guys. Right now. Pardon me. I'm. I haven't had dinner yet. I'm kind of munching on a little bit of something right now. Well, hopefully, this has really kind of helped put this in picture for you. That's my goal. And whether or not you decide to come on the China super sourcing trip is inconsequential because the real goal is to help you be successful. And a lot of these methodologies, a lot of these thought processes, a lot of these sources, they really will help you in just about any business that you decide to get into. You know, so hopefully, you know, you guys got a lot of value out of it. We really appreciate your time because like I said earlier, man, your time is the most valuable thing you have and I don't want to waste your time just like I don't want to waste mine. And so, you know, we appreciate it. We hope you got everything out of it that you need to get out of it. We look forward to seeing those last nine people sign up so that they can be 
part of this great trip and get that post trip mastermind day and come hang out and source with me as we source in China and I can give you more knowledge and kind of show all the things we've talked about I get to show you <clears throat> and if I take you by the hand and I show you one, one step at a time <coughs> excuse me <coughs> how to do this I hope that uh, it'll help change your life woo man that one got stuck in the windpipe <laughs> excuse me I apologize but I hopefully you know taking you one step at a time holding you through the process and then holding you accountable as well because I'll tell you what we're going to do the webinars and we're going to go over every process again because you may not catch it all in China it's exciting there's a lot of things that I learned that not everybody gets everything because of so much that's going around so I'm going to continue to be on you I'm going to continue to work with you I'm going to continue to go over these processes and help you along the way in our weekly mastermind sessions where we go through this process again while you're doing it so you know it's not just hey let me give you this webinar and tell you like I'm doing right now it's more of hey here it is but come with me I'm gonna show you how you know follow me and I will show you how to do this not just tell you and that's really the, the difference between what we do here our philosophy at GDW and the reason why I put this together the way it is so we look forward to it. We appreciate you. Have a good evening. Enjoy your family time. And uh, and we will definitely, you know, look at making things happen. So get on there. Get in this trip now. Uh, at the rate we've been moving, you know, by early next week, I doubt there are any spots left. So I jump on it. They There are only nine left. And uh, make sure that you're part of it. Those of you who are already part of it, man, this, I promise you, life-changing experience, life-changing education. This is going to be probably unlike any seminar you've ever gone to because it's not a seminar. It's a coaching event and a mastermind. And we're going to show you and coach you all the way through this thing to make sure that your odds of being successful are substantially higher than anyone who just goes to some hotel event. Jeff, you want to close it out, buddy? Absolutely. I think I will serenade. No, I'm just kidding. Um, thank you, everybody. Again, your time's valuable. You stayed on here a really long time. We absolutely don't take that for granted. And we can't make these epic without your questions and your interaction and engagement. We look forward to seeing all of you that are joining us in China when you join us in China. And um, if you're not able to join us in China this time, hopefully you will join us another time or qualify for one of our masterminds or who knows who knows what else we're going to be doing over the next year or so. So thanks again. Thanks for your attention. Very much gratitude goes out to you. Have a great night. Have a great rest of your week. And we'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.